Yeah, I'm going to be happy because the head. Well, the shack. And then even if I'm going to be a Want I think, yeah, it is so good to be this man to tell. Yeah, this man with a long geschiedenis. How can you say that he with Martin Luther King has been I think he is for us. He said, what do you in the verte with him have been wandeled? Maybe because they were there. But the most for us were there not yet. For us is history, and history. And for him was it reality. Yeah, he met him wandeled, and he has stood after the same things that Martin Luther King then also stood. Equality. He has always been for us. Hij heeft al 38 jaar geeft hij les in San Francisco aan de universiteit, maar hij is altijd bezig geweest over de gelijkheid. Ja? De gelijkheid in de maatschappij. Amerika kent het niet anders dan iemand die altijd te strijden is geweest. Hij heeft het niet alleen maar gezegd, maar hij heeft ook geprobeerd in al zijn uh, uitingen en al zijn vormen die hij ter beschikking had om dat te doen. Hij heeft ook gezegd, zeg drie dingen als je mij gaat voorstellen. Zeg dat ik een spiritual leader ben, zeg dat ik een scholar ben en zeg dat ik een organizer ben. Want die drie dingen, ja, dat zijn de drie dingen die belangrijk zijn voor een mens om ergens iets bekend te kunnen maken. Ja, je moet altijd je God en je spirit volgen. Ja? En welke God het is, ja, dat laten we altijd in het midden. We zeggen, misschien is het wel die ene die ze ons hebben aangeleerd. Of misschien is het wel die andere die uh, ik vanuit een verre cultuur ooit heb tegengekomen. Ja? Maar je moet altijd een spiritual leader zijn voor jezelf. Ja? Dat is belangrijk. Ja? En de scorer. Ja? Je knows. Je kan gaan en je weet precies wat je te horen krijgt en wat je gaat leren. Ja? Woord voor woord, letter voor letter, vertelt hij alle kennis die hij heeft en raakt hij over. Ja? En hij organiseert je. Grote mars, hij heeft negen, voor 950 man, ja, was er een mars georganiseerd. En hij heeft daar gesproken en hij heeft al die mannen verteld hoe ze hun leven moeten gaan organiseren. Ja, om leaders te kunnen zijn. Ja, om voorbeeld te zijn in de maatschappij. Moet je nagaan als deze 950 mannen allemaal hebben gedaan wat hij heeft gezegd, wat een krachtige maatschappij we opzetten. En die weer verdubbelen en doorgeven. Jullie zijn misschien met weinigen, maar je weet hoe het werkt, hè. Je hebt eentje nodig. Als eentje tegen de ander zegt, dan heb je er al twee en zo gaat het door. Een kettingreactie. We hopen ook dat hij vandaag hetgeen wat hij zegt zodanig vertelt dat jullie het als een kettingreactie door kunnen geven. Ja? Eerst zelf absorben en dan doorgeven. Ja? Zodat het gewoon levendig blijft en dat we dus weten waar het over gaat in deze maatschappij. Ja? Meneer, Mr. Professor, Dr. Oba. Tashaka, can I please actually join me? And I want to love to have you. Are you presentation? No? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Nobody needs translation, so. Okay. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, I have some of the microphone. Uganda. I understand that means, how are you? I, I want to say that it's, it's very good to have the opportunity to be here in Rotterdam. And um, for the last couple of months, I've had conversation with Sister Gloria Becker. And uh, she's been very nice. We've negotiated, we've talked, we spent a lot of time arranging and planning for this. So I really want to thank uh, Gloria uh, for her work. And uh, we Masanga, uh, I understand the history of this center and how it served as a place for people in Suriname uh, here in Rotterdam. And it's good to see a place like this where uh, our people can come together and have a place where they can support each other. I spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom and when African people first came to the United Kingdom, they had to do the same thing, provide a base for black people coming into the United Kingdom because it was not a welcoming place. And uh, places like Manchester provided a place where black people could come together and cooperate. 
economically and politically. And I want to say that I know that uh, the black people here come from many areas of the world, but principally Suriname. And I know that how many people here, their, their people are from Suriname, or they're from Suriname directly, how many? How many are from other places? Where are you from? Hey. Hey. Good as hell. Of course not. Hey. Where else? Where are you from? Give me the sound. Good as hell. Oh, Carousel. Good as hell, yeah. Good as hell, Good as hell, Sid Mountain. Hey. Yeah. So we'll be talking about some things that affect all those areas. Uh, Emil Carker Brawl, getting us out. And tomorrow we'll be doing leadership training, and part of that is around some of the work of Emil Carker Brawl, who's the greatest leader in the 20th century, bar none. And since I come from the United States, it would be tempting to say Malcolm X. But when we look at the record, he was the best. So we'll be talking about him tomorrow because part of the modeling that we're going to use for leadership training tomorrow is around Amy Parker Brown. Um, the people of Suriname, many people know about the Haitian Revolution, and we know that that was the only time in the history of the world that enslaved Africans or any enslaved people freed themselves from slavery. The only time. Uh, and built a nation. But we also know that in Suriname, when Africans were brought by the Dutch to Suriname, no sooner they got there, they went into the outback or to the, to the forest and fought. And uh, many Africans in the Western Hemisphere don't know a much, as, as much about Suriname as we should know. And the, and the thing that impresses me most about Africans from Suriname is that they not only fought, but even when they were caught, one great Suriname warrior was caught, and they were going to put him on a rack and break every bone in his body. He was at least six foot four, muscular paw, scared the whites to death. And he said, the jaguar in the forest is afraid of me. And then he threw himself on the rack. They broke every bone in his body, and he didn't utter a word. And so one of the things about the people of Suriname, but the people of South America, the black people, the black people in the Caribbean, and the black people in the United States, contrary to popular opinion, we proved to be unbreakable. We proved to be unbreakable. And it's a myth that they broke us in slavery, not hardly. We came out a tough people. And the very fact that you have, we Masanga here is an example of that, that people from Suriname came here and saw an empty building, they said, we'll take it. <laughs> and what could the government do? They had to say, oh, these people have their nerve. And they finally said, I guess we'll have to go along with it. And I understand on the street, Suriname culture is real strong with the whites on the streets. Just as in the United States, our culture is very strong. So it's, it's very good to be here to exchange with our people. Because we're one people with many different flavors. But it's all coming from one source, which is Africa. So what I want to speak with you today about is a topic that has to do with two worldviews, the African worldview and what we call the European worldview. You're going to see that we should use another term to describe that or define that. And the reason I chose this as the topic is the world's in crisis, the world's in trouble. By the end of the 21st century, if the Western model continues to prevail, and that's the Western paradigm, the Western philosophy, the Western worldview, this planet will not be inhabitable. So it's not just a question of how do we free the minds of African people. That's a big concern. But it's a question of how can there be a future for this planet. And you will see that the Western worldview 
is behind much of what's wrong with this planet. There's some good things too. I'm not here to say that everything from the West is bad. That wouldn't be rational. I'm a scholar. So I have to be objective and say there's positive and negative in everything. But basically this worldview is what's putting the planet in crisis. So this topic, the clash between the Western civilization model and the African civilization model has to do with alternatives that can help save the planet. And I'm not suggesting that our model is the only one. You have an Asian model, you have Native Americans who have their model, and you have progressive models even coming from whites. But the fact is, this is a primary model since humanity's origin is in Africa and uh, much of what represents what is balanced and what has been tested comes out of the African worldview. So if we look at what's going on in the world today, if we look where I'm coming from, the United States, you might think, even though the United States is messing the planet up, I always say the best thing the United States could do is leave the world alone. If the United States could leave the world alone, the world would be in much better condition. And when the British had power, you could say the same thing. But while it may look like America is the big, bad power on the block, historically, we're in a particular historic period. And this is a period of the decline of the West and the decline of the United States. The rise of Asia and the rise soon of Africa. Just for a little, because we're talking about the African civilization, and just attended seminar just last week about Africa, and we just we learned one big lesson: we cannot speak about Africa. As Africa is not a com country, they said. So Africa is divided in fifty-four. So when you're talking about Africa civilization, which part of Africa? I'm talking about a common worldview. There is a cultural unity in Africa. And that cultural unity outweighs whatever the differences are. And the differences are often strengths. We learn from the strengths. But the Western worldview would like to create the impression that Africa is all different. It is not a country. It's a continent. It's a continent. But it has underneath it common cultural worldview. Now this is a presentation, so I allowed that, but uh, we'll do the interruption at the end when you know when we have the discussion. Because this is not this part's not a discussion, but I that was a good question. But from now on at the end we'll get into the questions and answers. But that's a good question. There's a cultural unity. Uh, so what we're looking at today is we are witnessing, we already know the decline of the West. The West went into decline with World War I. And by the end of World War II, the United States emerged as a major world power. So what we need to look at today is one, what led to the rise of the West, which is the same thing that caused its decline. Because your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. That is a truism in life, you know? And in fact, Amilcar Cabral said that the greatest problem the liberation movement has is its own weaknesses. And often it derives from your strengths. So what we need to look at today is what caused the rise of the West, which has also contributed to its decline. So that's one thing. The other thing is, what is it in this Western worldview that has created the crisis for this planet? And this is the big thing. And this will be a part of the focus of this presentation today. But the question is, out of that, what are the alternatives? And so this is the point that uh, I want to deal with today. With the rise of Europe, it really begins as a world power with the rise of the Moors in Spain.
The Moors in Spain conquered uh, Spain in 711 uh, AD and operated in Spain, ruled Spain, until 1491 AD. And this was a time in which Europe um, had come out of the Dark Ages, Rome had collapsed, Europe was in crisis. There were no educational centers in Europe. The bubonic plague was strong. And what happens after a African warrior named Tariq bin Ziyad outnumbered led an army into Spain. Over a week of battle, he succeeded in conquering Spain. This was a black man. Tariq means the rock. The rock of Gibraltar is named after this general, Tariq bin Zid. And so from 711 to 1491, uh, Africans and then also Arabs, all of whom were Muslims, ruled Spain. It raised Spain to a very high level. They set up university systems in Spain, in Granada and many other places. They brought in the most advanced agricultural systems in the world. And they engaged in world trade. And so it is the Moorish presence in Spain that contributed to what became the European Renaissance and it is the period in which Europe begins to flower. And in fact, with the conquest by the Spanish of Spain finally removing the Moors in 1491, you then see the Europeans begin to move across the world. And it begins um, with uh, the Spanish, uh, Christopher Columbus being sent by Spain. He himself was Italian. And they begin to explore the new world. And what you begin to see is Europe becomes a plague on the world. Because Europe had been a very small place. And you know this place, Europe was a killing field. Europeans were killing each other for hundreds of years. And in fact, a lot of the brutality you see expressed towards us, they practiced towards themselves before they ever got a chance to do it with us. And so what you see then is Cortez uh, moving into Spain. With, uh, in, into Mexico with, with only a small army, but he has one advantage, a little gunpowder. And we see the conquest of the Mayan civilization. The, the Mayans had great armies. They didn't have gunpowder. And this is a key thing to the rise of the West, is technique. Gunpowder had been invented in China. It had also been invented in Egypt and by the Moors, but it had never been used as a weapon of warfare that was used throughout the military system. The Chinese only used it to assault cities. But they never integrated it into their armies until the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And so this was one of the keys to the rise of the West was a technique of gunpowder. Do not think they rose because we couldn't fight. The Asante people fought a hundred year war against the British and won every war until the last one. And it was a sister, Yah Santiwa, Queen Mother, who led the last battles against the British. And my name, Shaka, Tashaka of the Zulu nation. That was one of the best disciplined military systems in the history of the world. And in fact, uh, a successor of Shaka, the Zulu nation. And Zulu means heavenly people, by the way. Heavenly people could fight. So don't get it wrong. Don't think that we're just a peaceful people. They came and took us. No. If we had the techniques, meaning we manufactured gunpowder, we wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. You understand? <coughs> That's the only thing that separated us. So there's a great warrior, Setuweo, who was a great general that followed Shaka. Setuweo was so good that he went up against the British Square. The British Square was a system because they only had single loading muskets where you'd have a line of British soldiers, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten. The first rank would fire, reload. Second, there was continuous fire. Septuweo's army with spears broke up this British square at the Battle of Islandia. So you have to understand, African people fought. Native American people fought. But because of the technique, and the brutality that Europeans had carried out on themselves that they had practiced for hundreds of years, 
technique combined with brutality led to what? The er eradication of the Native Americans of the United States. 90% of them murdered by the whites. The slogan in the United States was, the only good Indian was a dead Indian. And the fiercest whites was not the army. It was a mass of everyday white people. And the Scots-Irish, they were the worst. Because the Scots-Irish had been trained in Ulster. The British sent, and they were not Irish, they were Scotsmen. They were sent in to take Irish land in Ireland. And how did they do it? They cut their heads off and scalped them. So you need to understand that the brutality that the West practiced on us, they had practiced on themselves first. And that was the beginning of their rise. There's a place called Tasmania. It's an island. They wiped out every single Tasmanian. They sent the Irish in, the British did, who were convicts. And they told these convicts, that for every two years you could bring in of a Tasmanian, you get five years cut off your prison sentence. They wiped out every single Tasmanian. The same thing in Australia. You understand? So the point is, part of the rise of the West has come through brutality. Yet, now, they are the heart of gentility and civilization. And they will call us the savages. Yeah. You understand? So part of the rise of the West has to do with uh, technique and brutality. Part of the rise of the West has to do with white supremacy. Now, believe it or not, I didn't come here today to talk primarily about white supremacy because we're pretty well familiar with white supremacy. I'm going to go beyond that. I always like talking about what people don't talk about. We are, we are well informed of white supremacy. But I'm going to start with it, because if I did, you'd be disappointed. Because black people always like you to talk about racism and white supremacy. So I don't want to disappoint you. And also, it's important, because it affects us today. But there's much more that affects us today than white supremacy, and that's the European worldview. And that's what we miss. That's going to be the main theme of this presentation. How did that slip? On its <coughs> One of the authors of white supremacy is a man named George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel. How many people have heard of him? Right. There's a very important book that he wrote called The Philosophy of History. And uh, he should call it The Philosophy of Mythology because he is one of the strongest of the European philosophers and historians only because of the effect that he had on other historians and philosophers. And what's most important about Hegel is that Hegel influenced both the left wing, Karl Marx, and the right wing, Adolf Hitler. Now you gotta be pretty strong to take both of those wings. Karl Marx was influenced by what you call dialectical materialism, the idea of the theory of opposites. Hegel talked about that. And of course, Adolf Hitler was influenced by white supremacy. But I must say this, Adolf Hitler's main model for white supremacy was the United States. He used the extermination of Native Americans, the reservation system that they put Native Americans on, and slavery, and the lobotomies that they performed on people, and the system of segregation that they imposed on us. So Hitler's working model was the United States. I often say, one of my students wanted me to come to Germany. I said, I'm not interested in going to Germany, but I had to think about it. I live in the United States. That's where the Nazi model was, you know what I mean? So I shouldn't be interested in living in the United States. The only reason is I was born there, you know what I mean? So the thing is, Hegel comes up with this myth of different Africas. There's Africa north of the Sahara. And he calls this white Africa. And then there's Africa in the northeastern corner, which is Egypt. And he says, this is a part of the spirit of Asia. Now, how can North Africa be white Africa? And how can Egypt be a part of the spirit of Asia? He was too smart to say it was Asia, because he knew no one would fall for that. 
Now, how could Egypt be a part of the spirit of Asia when Egypt was founded according to Sheikh Ana Diop 10,000 years ago? Even if you want to deal with the unification of Egypt 3200 BC, before the Christian era, that's before they had any Asian civilizations. So how could Kemet be a part of the spirit of Asia when it existed before Asia? And then here's another question. Kemet means land of the blacks, black-skinned people. If you look at the Meadow Nature, it's a tar, it, it's charcoal black person. You understand? But this is Hegel. He creates this myth. And then he says, Africa has no concept of God because he creates Africa south of the Sahara. And according to him, Africa south of the Sahara is an Africa that does not know God, does not know law, and does not know political organization. Now, this is Hegel. Now, there's a problem with this. He says, Africa is a place that does not know God. The problem with this is that, according to Hegel, Africa does not know God. But if you look at the three major religions of the world, they're not the only ones, but three major ones, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, they all owe their origin to ancient Kemet. Moses was a student under the pharaoh Akhenaten, who I'll show in a minute. The idea of one God comes from him. But Judaism, Islam, and Christianity inherit from Kemet the idea of the Ten Commandments. It comes from the 42 Confessions of Innocence. The only thing is, there are 32 more. And so one of them is, thou shalt not instill fear in the heart of another. In other words, it's not just your behavior, but your thoughts. Because in Africa, there was a belief that a crime was when you thought about something. If you thought about having a man's wife, you committed adultery. And in fact, it was a capital offense, because in Africa, there are a couple of things you didn't do. You didn't kill, you didn't steal, and you didn't mess with another man's wife. <laughs> Those three, you could lose your life for. But you could lose your life for thinking about it. And there's one example uh, in South Africa where a commoner, an everyday person, left a present for the king's wife on the ground. He was killed for that because he was trying to seduce the king's wife. It's not because the king was so important. The idea was a crime starts with the thought. That's how highly moral African people are and have been. That it's not just a crime to do wrong, but to think wrong. What kind of civilization is that? You hear me? So the thing is, according to Hegel, we had no conception of God. The problem with that is, we gave birth to their religions. And the problem with it for Hegel is, Hegel inherits a religion that isn't even European. It's Semitic. I mean, I don't claim Jesus to be African. He was dark-skinned. He had woolly hair. But he was Hebrew. You understand? But he was not European. And so that's a problem for the European. Because they have a religion they can't live up to. It's not theirs. You know what I'm saying? Be kind and just. The meek shall inherit the earth. What Europeans believe that? You hear me? <laughs> They believe that the meek shall inherit 10, 10 inches of the earth, 12 inches. They'll be buried in the earth. They believe that if you're meek, you're weak. That's the Western ethos. Am I telling the truth? Huh? So the thing is, Hegel creates a myth. We know that African people are the most God-oriented people on the planet. We give God credit when God isn't even interested in receiving it. God is everywhere. Anything happens, we say, thank God. Sometimes we should say, thank our mother. Thank our father. God gets credit when God doesn't even want credit. But that's how God-centered we are. I'm not knocking it. It's a good thing. You know? We're a good
God-loving people. And since we've been brainwashed by the West, a God-fearing people. Because anything that you love, you shouldn't fear. Am I telling the truth? And God is infinite force outside of space, outside of time. I've seen a little piece of God, beautiful light, a piece of heaven. And I can tell you that God is nothing but kindness. Nothing but goodness. There's no love like God's love. Your mother's love is the closest thing to it. And maybe your wife or your husband, or I understand here, your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Maybe. But that doesn't come close to God. So this idea of fear, because notice they create the myth that God's a man, and then God suddenly becomes a white man. Yeah. You understand? And then that's really putting us in double trouble. I wouldn't call God a black man either. You know what I mean? God's a spirit. Yeah. So the thing is, this is a white man who wanted to call himself a Christian philosopher. What a contradiction. Because he's going to have to deal with black people here. You understand? This is the source of his so-called religion. He says that Africa north of the Sahara is white Africa. Now why does he say that? Because there's a place called Carthage, where a man named Hannibal came from. And you see, they want to turn Hannibal black. And in fact, in the movies, he becomes Hannibal Lecter, a mass murderer. So not just a mass murderer, he eats people. What a joke. Hannibal is one of the greatest warriors in the history of the world, but the greatest military strategist. The Battle of Cannae. Hannibal wiped out 85,000 Romans. I'm a warrior. I study war, by the way. One of my specialties is war. I never lost a battle either. Fought a lot of battles. Never lost one. Because one rule in war is know your enemy. The other rule is know yourself. And that doesn't mean me. It means us. Know your strengths. Know your weaknesses. Hannibal was the master of that. He made one mistake. He wiped out 85,000 Romans. And the second best general he had next to him was a general in charge of the Numidian cavalry of North Africa. And he said, now, my general, we must take Rome. And he said, no. And I talked to John Henry Clark, who was one of the master teachers that I studied under. And John said he thought Hannibal didn't do this because he didn't have the heart to do what he's going to have to do. Because if he took Rome, all he had to do was kill men, women, and children. Africans have trouble doing that. But a few years later, Scipio Africanus II would take his war to Carthage, and he would turn Carthage into salt. He didn't care about killing men, women, children, babies, old people. You understand? That was Hannibal's mistake. But the point is, you're going to claim North Africa? I don't think so. And Carthage is the place of Tunisia, where the Arab Spring began. You remember? And it's the one place in North Africa where they've actually had a successful movement. So according to um, this author of white supremacy, therefore, Africa is a place, he said, shut off from the world, uncivilized. They're savages. And he says, as a result, we owe them nothing. We should forget about them. And they should be grateful for being our slaves. <laughs> and then for 240 years, it varies with each people in the Western Hemisphere. We had drummed into our heads a savage in Africa, a slave wherever you were. And so what that was saying was, yeah, it was so bad there, you should be thankful for these hundred lashes we're giving you here. Mm -hmm. wow. You should be thankful for being busted on a rack because we're giving you Jesus. You hear me? We're going to save you. So this is the myth of white supremacy. And I should say also that the origin of white supremacy is in Asia it is in India. And it is when the Aryans who swept into India conquered the black civilization, then called Dravidians. They prefer to call themselves Bali. These are the people who now call them untouchables. 
And they had a highly civilized uh, society run by priests, Brahmins. And um, it was a egalitarian society where people shared the wealth. And they were conquered. But the key thing is, when the Aryan came in, the Aryan took the African system, which was a caste system, and in parts of Africa, caste is used for occupation. And they turned it into a system where it became racial. And so it was called Varna, V-A-R-N-A. And what that meant was when the Aryans came in, they were white, they said, their God said that these Africans are ugly. They're savages. They're uncivilized. And so they reduced the Africans to Sudra, which is slave, and to untouchable, which is a category below slavery. If you can imagine a category below slavery. And so this is really the beginning of white supremacy. And Hegel is an inheritor of it. So I want to satisfy your needs that I've discussed white supremacy. And by the way, this is the picture of the father of monotheism, Akhenaten, who was the one that taught Moses, who was a pharaoh in the 18th dynasty, who taught this idea of one God. But the thing about it is, Kemites, Egyptians, always believed in one God. Africans have always believed in one God. The difference with Akhenaten is that Akhenaten reduced uh, or removed from the pantheon a spirit, what the Kemites called netters, or divine principles, or ancestors. Uh, I'm into Ifa, and they have, a, in the Yoruba system, which is a spirit system, um, they have Olu Dumari, who is God, and then they have spirit beings that assist God. And so, Africans have an idea that heaven's or organized like a government. And so God delegates to certain spirits certain things. So Maya Orisha, which is a spirit, uh, is Obatala. Obatala is the Orisha of um, old age, of wisdom. Obatala's favorite color is white. So all over Africa you have this idea that there's God, the supreme God, which in ancient Kemet was a moon called by different names. And then he had netters. And so one uh, was Asar, uh, the netter of life, death, and rebirth. Tomorrow we're going to go into leadership training. And we're talking about establishing here in Rotterdam and in the Netherlands an African-centered leadership training program called Perant, which is the highest educational system in the world. I went through Perant training because it's in our culture. We carry these systems into the Americas. And that's why whenever you see a black person that's really good, they may have degrees or they may not. They may come to the university or not, but they have always had to come through this African system. And this African system is the strongest system going. The last eight months of John Henry Clark's life, I interviewed him on the Masters at Chape Tim. He had a high school education. He had a library of 25,000 books. He had so many masters, he forgot the teachers who had taught him. I call him two or three times a week to interview him. I'm writing a book on this because it'll help in the operation of France, but more important, it's to reclaim and hold on to the highest things we have in our culture. They reproduce the heaviest people. In, in the States, we call it the baddest, which means the ones who are the, the smartest. The sharpest. You hear me? Bad is good. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, and all over the African world, we have these systems, but we don't give ourselves credit for it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So the thing is, uh, you know, we see this. So my main topic today is not on white supremacy. but it's on the European worldview. Dr. Jacob Carruthers was one of my teachers. How many people have heard of Jacob Carruthers? A little guy. 
maybe this big, deep voice. He called himself, I'm just Jake from Chicago. He is actually from Texas, you know what I mean? By way of Chicago. He was a very humble brother. And I studied under him. That's a part of what you do in this African system. To become a master, you try and master masters. Doesn't mean you try and be better than them, but you try and learn from them. And what I like most about Jake, he was a nice person. And the th second thing I liked about him was he was absolutely brilliant. Third thing I liked about him was he was humble. In fact, when he'd give a speech, he'd say, there's nothing new under the sun. And when he got through speaking, you had all kinds of new stuff. Mm -hmm. That was Jake. And so we had a war council in the 1990s. We were fighting around African-centered education. I led that fight in the Black United Front. And we were getting African-centered education in the public schools all over the country. So we had a war council of scholars. We met at a center called the Center for Inner City Studies. And uh, it's now called the Center for Jacob Carruthers Studies. And the chair of the National Black United Front was a brother named Dr. Conrad <coughs> Worrell. I was national vice chair in charge of organizing and training. So we were strategizing. So we broke up into workshops, and we went into Dr. Carruthers' office. And he had all these manuscripts. And Dr. Carruthers didn't use a computer. So he had all these manuscripts with scratching and correction and everything else on it. And I asked for every one of them and got all of them. Some of them have been published. And one of them was on thinking about European thought. So I want to give credit where credit is due because my starting on looking at this starts with Jake from Chicago. And Jake said this. He said, we know a lot about white supremacy and it's important. But you know, there's more to how the West is operated than white supremacy. We must study the European mind. So we must understand this European mind because we have to understand something. Number one, Europeans were oppressing Europeans before they even got to us. You need to understand what was behind that. And then number two, you've got to understand what drove them to world power and world conquest. Yeah, they had techniques. But the Chinese actually took an expedition in the 1400s AD, a naval expedition, and traveled around the world. They had 25,000 soldiers on these great ships. They went all over the world. They went to Africa. They were in Asia. And then they went back. There were six of these trips. They were led by a Muslim Chinese who was a eunuch. And they put him in charge because at that time, Islam was powerful. It was a smart move. But in the whole course of these travels, it never occurred to the Chinese to try and conquer the world, and they had more power than the Europeans, but it never crossed their mind. The Kemites, they had great navies, but it never occurred to them to try and conquer the whole world. They didn't even want to. So what is it in the European mind that led to this? And I really want you to get this real clear, real clear. What is behind this? Because you need to understand it. Europeans need to understand it as well, because most people operate on their culture uh, subliminally. They don't really know what it is. If you ask the average white, black, brown, red, yellow person what's their culture, they're not going to tell you. They live it. That's sufficient. But now, since the planet is endangered by this worldview, perhaps it's important we understand what it's based on. Jake made this point. He said, when we look at what you call the European, we need to look at how he defined himself. He didn't call himself a European. Remember, Europe is a recent invention. It's recent. When there was Rome, there was no Europe. It's a recent invention. What they called themselves were Aryans. A-R-Y-A-N, Aryans. And by the definition, you shall know what it means. Aryan means Lord and Master. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> their view of their relationship of the world to the world is they should have mastery over it. That's their view. Ain't that interesting? 
Who entitled them to that? You hear me? And so it is this uh, labeling, which they label themselves that, they also call them Indo-Europeans. We need to understand that because that's what really defines an Eastern European, a Western European, or if you want an Iranian. An Iranian is also an Arab. He happens to be Islamic. And by the way, I sympathize with them. They wanted a nuclear weapon for a good reason, to keep America out. America doesn't invade a country that has nuclear weapons. Ask the doctor. He made the mistake of giving up his nuclear program and then got on his knees to the West and then they decided to take him out. And now even Barack Obama is saying he's sorry they did it. Not because they took him out, but because things fell apart. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty fell. <laughs> and they could not put him back together. So the thing is, we got to understand it's this Aryan worldview that we need to look at. And I might say this also. I'm a revolutionary. I usually don't advertise that. And by the way, Theofelo Benga, how many people have heard of him, Theofelo Benga? He was Sheikh on a Diop's best student, along with Jacob Carruthers, but he was the only one trained directly by Sheikh. Um, Jacob Carruthers and Dr. Asa, uh, Dr. Theophilo Binger were about equal when it came to their knowledge of ancient Kemet. I wouldn't rate one above the other. And each would be too humble to say that they were even on the top. In fact, I'd say Theophilo Binger has exceeded Diop. Written 17 books, speaks 10 languages. We hired him at San Francisco State. When I stepped down as chair, my last interview with John Henry Clark, he was nearly dying. I went to his house in New York. And the first thing I found out is Theofelo Binger was looking for a job. And I had been with Leonard Jeffries. Jeffries told me this. And so I said to John, I said, John, should we hire Theofel? Of course, it's kind of like asking a Christian, uh, should you go see Jesus? <laughs> he said, yeah, if he wants a job. You know what I mean? So we hired him. So uh, Theofelo Binger uh, played a very important uh, part in this. But... Dr. Carruthers was um, discussing um, the point of the European worldview. And he was saying that what we need to understand is the Aryan worldview as opposed to the European worldview. And what I would say to that is this, that we need to understand that there isn't as much difference between Marxism and capitalism as you think. Marxism is good because it wants to equitably distribute the wealth. Capitalism is bad because it's based purely on greed. But they both share a common worldview, which we're going to discuss now. So what's, what's this Aryan worldview? This Aryan worldview has to do with a particular conception of power, how power is used. And this is connected to their view of freedom. And we've been sold a false bill of goods on what freedom means in terms of the West. We think it means one thing, but actually judge people by their practice, and their practice will tell them what they really mean. So part of this Aryan worldview has to do with their idea of freedom. And it is a very important idea to understand because we think it means one thing, but if you look at how it operates, it means another. And then we have to look at what is their conception of philosophy or of human thought? And there is a particular common thread through that. And there's a lot to it. I don't have time to go into it because you have a lot of thinkers and stuff. Philosophy is one of my areas. It's my first love when it comes to disciplines because it's the, Dr. Carruthers called it, it's the deep thought of a people. When you get into philosophy, you're going into the deepest part of a people's mind and spirit. So this has to do with uh, how they view the world, philosophy. Then it has to do with science. What's their view of science? What is the view? Because we often think science is objective. All science is pretty much the same. But there's a view of science. Different people have different approaches to science. And the Aryan worldview has an approach to science. And then there's a question of economics. 
what's the view of economics? What is underneath this? This is why I say when you deal with both Marxism and capitalism, there's some common features, even though there's some good features, particularly in Marxism. Then there's the question of government. What's their view of government? And I should say this, Africa's in trouble because we have their way of government. We'll get into that later. Suriname's in trouble because you got their way of government. Much of the Caribbean, with the exception of a few places like my wife Pam, Pam's here, my wife here. She comes from Barbados, a little 240, 250,000. They live better there than they live, the, those that have left to the United States. Because one thing they have is leadership. They, they might steal a little, they don't steal much. So little that they can walk among their people without any guards, any protection. Can you imagine a president of the United States doing that? Can you hear me? And then our revolutionary either. I remember John Henry Clark telling me, because he really knew his Caribbean, his African history, John did. He said, they're the goody goody two feet of the Caribbean. <laughs> they're law and order people. You know what I mean? Now, now I married a wife who's got a radical spirit and a big mouth. You know what I mean? <laughs> so she doesn't quite conform to the law and order end of it. But she still believes in avoiding anything that would get her in jail. <laughs> My father had the same attitude, and he was a rebel. And he had three fears, and one of them was jail. And he never t he had airplanes as a fear, hospitals, and uh, you know, jail. Not white people. He was fighting the Klan when he was 12 years old, kicking the behinds of the Ku Klux Klan, 18 year old, 20. They came to his house to lynch him. He was a little, very light complexion. He looked like he was white, but he had black hair, black features. And the Klan was so embarrassed, they said, we'll get you the next time. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> that will be the next time. No, there sure wasn't. He left Texas. <laughs> but that was after he left a whole lot of mess in his way. So when we're looking at this Aryan worldview, we're looking at their view towards government. And we're looking at their view about the world uh, in general. So what is this African uh, Aryan worldview? I really want you to get this because it might not sound significant. The most dangerous part of this worldview, and I want to say that each of these figures I'm going to critique they have some truth in what they're saying. So I'm not knocking the whole thing. It's the essence of it. And the essence of what's wrong with this Aryan worldview is their project became one of taking spirit out of everything. Spirit out of everything. I was asking for a translation of the poetry that was just done. And it's basically he's telling you, you know, Facebook isn't really where you're going to get connection. And in fact, I think if you're looking for a mate and you're going on a website, good luck. <laughs> because, you know, relationships are based on vibrations. Yeah. You got to feel a person. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You got to feel if they have any character. Yeah. <laughs> so spirit drives everything. And so when I use this word, despiritualization, this book, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, I use it. I only have one small chapter on the European in there. I don't write too much about Europeans. Only chapter I didn't illustrate was this chapter. Because one thing when I have a book done, I have artists who paint things for me. That gives me a good excuse so I can get some good paintings from my house. <laughs> and I couldn't find anything inspiring to put in this chapter on the European worldview. And in fact, these pictures are not going to be inspiring that I'm going to show you. But if you're going to understand the Aryan worldview, you got to go beyond white supremacy. You need to understand white supremacy. They all were white supremacists. But you need to understand what really drove them to move to conquer the world. And what happened is Europeans made a decision to take spirit out of everything and to turn the planet to turn nature, to turn the cosmos into a material entity. And when you can materialize something and strip it of a spirit core, 
You can take it. And then what they did is they separated themselves from it. Meaning, you know, they created a separation from themselves and nature. And when you can do that, you can go about controlling it. But Africans had a view of this. The human being is a miniature cosmos within a larger cosmos. We're a miniature universe within a larger universe. I have a, a thing that I've come up with in African philosophy that says that in anything is everything. If you take one small part of this cosmos, I would even say one small part of a human being, if you know, and you know yourself, you know the smallest part of yourself, it reveals the whole. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. The whole, baby. You know it. You might not want anybody else to know it. So if you separate yourself from nature, how can you? 75% of the earth is water. 75% of a human being is water. You hear me? We're miniature universes walking around in a larger universe. We're inseparable from this. And so if you try and take nature and control it, it's like trying to take your mother and control it. Because this is big mama, bigger than any of us. And we can't separate what happens to it from us. What hurts it hurts us. Mm -hmm. And that's what's bringing down global warming and everything else right now. Because you mess with one part, you mess with the whole. An environmental movement is not sufficient to save the planet. You need a philosophy that has you in harmony with the planet. But even more than that, it's even more than that. So let's get into this Aryan worldview. A part of the materialization of Western man, and this is the key thing about Western man, is Western man has seen mainly the material. Not all Western men. And when I say men, I'm talking about the civilization. Not all. But they have tended to materialize things. For example, in Western thought, there's an argument uh, in the Greek, among the Greek philosophers that nothing comes out of nothing. Meaning that the empty is nothing. Well, where does life come from? You hear me? When that seed goes into the womb of a woman, it is barely visible, and then emerges as an embryo, and then it becomes life. But where did it come from before that? You hear me? Where did this whole cosmos come from? The Dogons say, from Sirius B. The smallest of dwarf stars that then exploded and the whole cosmos came into being. Astrophysicists agree with this. But then, where did Sirius B come from? <laughs> and then what they say is, there's a time in space where you had singularity, astrophysics. What that means is, there was a point where there was a curvature in space so small you can hardly see it. Astrophysicists claim you can see this wrinkle in space. That's where the whole cosmos came from. So. Nothing can come from nothing. <laughs> God is no thing and everything. Nowhere and everywhere. Your thoughts cannot be seen. But does that mean that they have no power? Yeah. Hmm? So let's start with Descartes. In this Aryan worldview, part of this separation of spirit from matter, Descartes' <coughs> contribution is to separate mind from body. And so Descartes had a truth. And in fact, it's very interesting. Descartes' formulation came from a dream. Now, isn't this interesting? <laughs> but what does he do with this dream? He says, I think, therefore I am. So he's saying that his thought is the reality. Now, there's a truth in this. The way you think is the way you are. Believe it. If you think you're strong, You've got a good chance of becoming strong. If you think you're smart, you have a good chance of demonstrating that you're smart. And if you have black kids put into a white school system where they're told they're dumb, and they come to believe that, they behave like that. So there is truth in that. But that's not all there is. And what he did is separate mind from body. Mind can't be separated from body. Mind and body are the same thing. He didn't care about his body. 
African said, the body is the temple mm -hmm. of the soul. You know, it's your temple. And so the thing is, how can you just say that it's just mine? And so the point is, Descartes was saying that the mind is the only thing. And so he's saying that it, it is the process for controlling everything else. I think, therefore, I am. Nothing wrong with thinking. Nothing wrong with the power of good thinking. But when you separate that from the body, and then you see that as the sole controlling force. And is it only the mind that thinks? Hmm? Is it only the mind? See, the Kemites had an idea called heart mind. They said they knew the brain. They invented medical science. They had dissected every part of the human body. And they understood the role of the brain. But they said there's a thing called heart mind. And the heart mind, they said, is the seat of exceptional intellectual clarity. And what they meant by that was that whereas the mind can think rationally and logically, it makes mistakes. But this heart mind never does. I was given a lecture, one of the last lectures I gave before I fully retired. And it was a former student of mine who's a nurse. And so she sent me an article, 99-page article, on the research that's been done on the heart, modern research, that shows that the heart emanates higher mental vibrations than the brain does. But what the Kemites understood, and what's very interesting, the Chinese have the same notion of heart and mind, the Japanese do, and both of these societies were black before they became Asian. The Anu are the founders and these are the Anu people here, my last book, Integration Trap, Generation Gap, caused by a choice between two cultures. This is a little Anu person. Chua, Europeans call them pygmies, wrong name, they don't like that. <laughs> and they're the founders of Kemet, Anu. Asar was Anu, little tiny guy, less than four feet, four inches tall. And you see this guy is left foot forward, it means royalty and a staff, staff of authority. And this mark up here is the mark of Set because for them, Set was their network, not Heru. And Set didn't have the negative implications of being the killer of, uh, of Osiris. Uh, so the point is that uh, the Anu are the founders of Kemetic civilization, Chinese civilization, and they're the first people in Japan, Anu. First people were black. The, these Japanese you see now, they come from Korea. And the Koreans and Japanese have conflict, but they have a common Asian origin. So the point is heart-mind. How is it that the heart could think? Well, the Kemites said, that's where God rests inside of you. Your ka, which is your destiny, which is your purpose. Now this, I think everyone in here knows, most of you know. Anytime you have a feeling and it comes from here, that feeling's never wrong. Most of you know that. And anytime you go against that feeling, you make a mistake. 1987, the earthquake was going to occur in San Francisco. Before it occurred, I had a program, I was in a graduate program. And I was supposed to be there four hours later. And this said, leave right now. And it's a feeling. It didn't talk, I didn't hear any voice. It just, you feel it, you know what it is. And then the rational, the mind said, oh no, I'll be sitting in that room for three hours. Wow. But then the heart mind said, and they never told me wrong. And so when I went around the head and the heart, I left three hours early. Had I left on time, the Bay Bridge opened up about where I would have been. And some cars went right into the ocean. Or the Dunbarton Bridge collapsed and smashed people. I would have been close to one of those two places. But the heart said, go. And I told a lot of people this, and they said, my heart didn't tell me anything. I said, yes, it did. You haven't been listening, listening so yes. long <laughs> that you've been shut off from yeah, yeah. You hear me? Yeah. And so 
There's nothing wrong with I think, therefore I am. If you understand, you feel, therefore I am. I, you intuit, therefore I am. That there are other powers of the mind and that to really do this, the body must be a temple that is taken care of and Descartes had no concern for the body. You hear me? So we have to understand this despiritualization. Descartes is a French intellectual and has a powerful influence on Western philosophy. Isaac Newton, again, great scientist. And he carries out a revolution in physics. And basically, what does he say? He says, there's a law in physics that governs the whole universe, and particularly Earth, but the whole universe. And so everything in the universe can be reduced to a law. Now the point is again, spirit is taken out of this. And so as a result, then quantum physics can be used as a basis for control. Yet if we understand quantum physics, what does it tell us? It tells us that this object here, if it's wood, is nothing but energy that holds it together. It's the spirit of the thing. That the essence of everything is spirit. Quantum physics tells you that. You hear me? Yet, Newton inherited a tradition that goes back to the Greeks where they said the atom is a material thing. You can't see it. It's energy. But as Theophilo Binga said, the master science, physics, the European is in trouble because they have no overriding concept of it because they took spirit out of it. The Kimites would call it Ma'at. The energy of harmony, the energy of truth, the energy, energy of justice and right order. The Chinese would call it Dao. They would call it this order of the cosmos. You know, the Chinese are good at telling you what something means by not telling you. That's their way, because they think in terms of dialectics, in terms of opposite. So they'll tell you what it isn't. And that's designed to get you to figure out what it is. But it's the way of kindness. You got about a hundred older Chinese running one billion three hundred million Chinese in China right now. Wow. And there's corruption. They got almost as many billionaires as they have in the United States, but they lifted three hundred million Chinese out of poverty. And they know they better lift the other billion out, otherwise that other billion is gonna throw them out. You hear me? And they know that as unjust as they are, they better follow something invisible, Tao. And so this new premier of China, he's trying to go after the corrupt. Now he's not really going after the most corrupt. They're all around him. They won't let him. But they know that if he doesn't begin to take head, his head will fall. You know what I'm saying? So the thing is, Isaac Newton makes a major contribution to science, but by taking spirit out, Science is used as an instrument of control. Lord Francis Bacon. How many people have heard of Lord Francis Bacon? He's the father of empirical science, meaning Bacon said that the Greeks are all right. They argued, they orated, and the Greeks were influenced by the Chemites. And so, you know, they had their great philosophers, some of them trained by the Chemites. And Francis Bacon said, well, that's all fine, but he said, science, what it needs to do is investigate. And what it needs to do is observe nature. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because if you want to learn something, study it, watch it, observe it. That's why we're studying this European mind right here. Because the question's gonna be, uh, what's the basis for this and the question is going to be how does it operate and so that's observing it so Francis Bacon said we should observe nature a good thing but then observe what he says after that so we can control nature and then he said so we can create a new nature Monsanto's and genetically modified organisms that's a part of this. That's what you call a mad science. Observing nature is not mad. But trying to control it 
is about as mad as you can get, and then trying to create a new one? But he's called Bacon, so it explains. <laughs> <laughs> well, he needs to become Bacon. <laughs> and once he becomes Bacon, we'd be in better shape. Nothing wrong with observing nature, but if you think about it, what's the point? One of controlling. Remember, the Bible also says that. And Bacon is using the Bible also as justification. It says, for man was given lordship over woman and over nature. And remember, nature is always called mother, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Mother nature. Huh? Mm -hmm. I ain't knocking Christianity. Get me wrong, because I think whatever path you choose is the right path. But don't choose the wrong and the right. And nothing is all right. You hear me? And nothing is all wrong either. So the thing is, uh, you know, we've got this notion here of controlling nature and then creating a new nature. And so now you have genetically modified organisms. So now they're creating a seed. They've created the seed. And once that seed goes into the ground, you can no longer plant a normal seed. It wipes the earth out for being able to handle a normal seed. It means that seeds are now turned into a commodity. Whereas God gave you the original seed, this is a seed that can't reproduce itself. That's why they made it. So you'd have to buy it. And so you have Indian farmers committing suicide because they cannot afford to buy the seed. The seed is a gift of God. You hear me? And so this is the mad science. The mad science. Africans have a different view. You know, we're talking about the European or the Aryan worldview versus the African worldview. The Bambara have a different conception of people from the area of Mali. Malcolm X's great, great, great grandfather, Ajar, was Bambara. Six foot four, built like a brick house, master builder and a warrior. Took no mess from white people. He was a house slave, by the way. They had house slaves like that. The Bambara said this, when God created everything, who they call Ma and Gala, interesting, Ma'at, Ma, M-A-A, -A, only the T's left out. They said, then God created 20 things. That was all the things of creation. But what was lacking was God had no one to communicate with. So God created man and woman, who they call Ma. Ma. Which is telling you, by the definition of your humanity, you're a God within yourself. Do you hear me? And that's the truth. And that's not just true for black people, it's true for all people. But you got to be God-like to take advantage of that. And it's no ego thing, I'm God. No, it's just that what God created has his, her, its divinity within it. A tree has it, a rock has it, water has it, but a human being has something special. And this is what the Bambara said. They said, when Ma and Gala created Ma, he gave Ma something special. And that was in addition to wisdom and the ability to communicate, the word. And the word had power as long as it was truthful. That's the power of the word. Africans always favor the oral over the written. I'm a writer, but I write the way I speak. Because there's more power in speech. But it's only powerful if there's truth behind what you say. And so the Bambara teach, first Ma, first ancestor, has the most powerful word because they got the word from God. They're the closest to God. In ancient Kemet, they call this Medunetcher, which is God speech, M-E-D-U-N-E-T-C-H-E-R, and then Medunefer, M-E-D-U-N-E-F-E-R, uh, human speech. So human speech, to be good, must be close to God's speech. It must be pure, free of falsehood. Now, what's the role of speech according to the Bambara? The role of speech, which is 
understand this. In, in ancient Kevin, when they said ma'at, how do they define it? Speak truth, do truth. Simple. There's no great big intellectual discussion. We do it in the West. Harvey, truth, justice, balance, right order. We go to do, 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 do. But it was simple. Speak truth, do truth. The power is in your speech, and there's no separation between speech and action. In Kemet, they had three concepts for that. Sia, who, and Hecker. Sia, exceptional intellectual clarity. Who, authoritative utterance. Because when your thoughts are clear and truthful, they come from the heart mind, then there's going to be authority in your utterance. It's going to come from the heart. And then Heka, which literally means magic, but it means the power of action. So when the mind, the speech, and the action are in alignment, there's power. There's power. And so what did the Bambara say is the role of speech? Which means the role of action. Because speech and action are inseparable. As opposed to controlling nature, they said Mangala created Ma to be guardians of nature. Isn't that beautiful? Not just to live in harmony with it, but to protect it. And then it said, because it's not that you're going to live in nature in a natural state and not make any improvements. It said, help bring nature to its perfection. Isn't that beautiful? You will never be able to do it. Because you'll never be able to bring yourself to it. Because only God can do that. But that is your effort. And that is very different from this controlling concept of controlling nature. And understand, if you have a view that you're going to control nature, you got a, a view that you're going to control your own woman. Because <laughs> it's inseparable. And if you got that view, you're in trouble, especially if you're going to try and control the black woman. Now, right? You're going to be in real big, bad trouble. And then, because you are related to someone that's like your mother, because whether you know it or not, you're drawn to women like your mother, and then you end up saying, calling her mama, and he's calling you papa, she's calling you papa and all this stuff, and then you realize, oh, you got your mother right here. You Try and control your mother. It's about the same as trying to control your lady. And the only thing worse is trying to control nature. That's even worse, because that's big bomb. You hear me? So this was Francis Bacon. And if we're going to save the planet, you need a worldview that provides an alternative to that. Adam Smith. The despiritualization of uh, everything proceeds on every level. And so Francis Bacon took spirit out of nature. He separated himself from nature to control it. And so we see with Adam Smith, Adam Smith deifies private property and deifies the idea of the wealth of nations and the wealth of individuals. And you know, there's nothing wrong with people having some wealth. Poverty is a bad thing. So don't, don't, don't think I'm in here preaching no poverty. But there is something wrong when you have a system in the world where a handful of people control more wealth than almost the whole planet. There is something wrong when the majority of the planet lives on $2 a day. And you can have a Bill Gates who looks all geeky, who's one of the, I think he's the richest man in the world who can walk around and have all these philanthropies and make it look all nice, and he's around here privatizing education, messing people's education up. Hell, he dropped out of Harvard, which he is did. nothing wrong. He had to be smart to do what he did. I'm not denying that the boy ain't smart. He's a geek, one-dimensional man. Probably wasn't too good with the ladies. You know what I mean? But the point is, if you got all that wealth, you got all that poverty. And so there's a deification of this, but the, the key thing you need to understand is the despiritualization of matter leads to this notion of private property. And there's nothing wrong with private property in this sense. You should have a house, you should have your clothes, 
You should have some wealth of your own, as long as it's not at somebody else's expenses. But who says that you should own the air? Who says that you should own the water? And I'm getting around to the hardest one for you to accept. Who says you should own the land? Amen. You hear me? Because all people prior to this project of despiritualizing everything and turning land into just a material object thought that the land was your mother. That's why they call it Mother Earth. It was a gift from God. Everyone had a right to it. And that's why in Africa, you didn't have prostitutes. You didn't have poverty. If you did, it was because there was a famine or something. And governments didn't oppress the people because there was no wealth for them to protect. The people had the wealth. You hear what I'm saying? Just because you see these kings with all of this, you know, gold on it and everything in Ghana, it didn't belong to them. But the land didn't belong to them. And by the way, these governments had no armies. Whereas state in the West means institution of violence. You couldn't have that concept because it's an institution to protect the few against the many. Because a few have grabbed everything. Europeans know about that because they've had revolutions over that. And Africans are now in that position where once they got their independence, that's what ended up happening. You understand? So the point is, this idea of private property in the land is a fiendish idea. And it's going to have to change. Because everyone has a right to it. Because it's like there's an old spiritual saying, I got the right to the tree of life. And the tree of life is what grows from the ground. That's the source of everything. And we all have a right to it. Now I know that's a hard idea to sell now because everyone wants to get rich. They want to get their little piece of the action. You understand? And I, again, I want to say, poverty is misery. You don't want it. Nope. I'm not arguing that. I'm a revolutionary. But I do believe that if you're going to fight for freedom, you need some capital. Yep. But I don't believe in being a capitalist. Sound like a contradiction, huh? But if you're going up against a powerful system, you're going to need something to, to sustain your army. I'm army is theory. I'm not talking about organizing an army. <laughs> not me. <laughs> so Adam Smith. So then property. The land is despiritualized. Strip it of any kind of spirit to it. Then you can control it. And then people can go and grab as much of it <coughs> as they want to. John Locke. How many people have heard of John Locke? Well, your system here is based on John Locke. System in France, Dutch land, anywhere. And most of the world is now based on John Locke. Now the Chinese are resisting. John Locke uh, wrote a number of things. The most important is two treaties on government. It's the second treaty that's most important. The United States political system is based on John Locke, their political system. In fact, the American political system is more British than the British system. Wow. Because the American whites imported into the United States European values, except they carried them to an extreme. There's only two original things about whites in America, culturally. One, they're not original. That's really original. You got to work hard at not being original because their culture is an import from Europe. If you ask them what's their dance, they'll say, oh, they have great classical music. It's European classical music. You understand? They did not evolve an art form in the United States, the European American. He's been too greedy, involved in grabbing money, land, and killing people to develop art. In fact, they've lost the ability to shake their hips well. Except for um, Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. He did pretty good. Because he was in Mississippi Blacks. around black people. I was told, in fact, that uh, he would sit under the piano of one of the great blues musicians and just watch him. And so he got the mannerisms and the music down pretty good. Ike Turner. Mm -hmm. He would sit under Tina Turner's husband. 
former husband, but sent under his piano. And he got those moves pretty good. Elvis did. Got the sound pretty good. But it ain't his sound. It's our sound. The other thing that's original about the European in America is he's an exaggeration of Europe. Whatever you've got in Europe, they have exaggerated it. If you have racism, you haven't seen racism until you come to the United States. Look at Donald Trump. Prototypical racist. We were sitting next to a European. What country was he from, Pam? The airport? Belgium. Belgium. And he was talking about, um, this Donald Trump is really bad, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly he started talking about the Syrians who have come into Belgium and how the government has given the Syrians everything. He gave an example of some Syrians that shot at somebody. And this is the example of they're bringing crime into Europe is all as though all Syrians are criminals. And why are they in Europe? Because America destabilized, Europe destabilized, foreign powers destabilized that country. And so as a result, now the chickens are coming home to roost. So he's against Trump. He's against Trump, but he's taking a Trump position. And I said, you know, if you were in America, you'd be for Trump. Because the Mexican in America is the Syrian in Europe. You understand? Same thing. And the Syrian, in fact, Europe needs Syrians. Europe needs Africans. They got a zero birth rate. They're not reproducing themselves. They need some people to come in here and give them some life. You know what I mean? That's why Merkel started letting them in. <laughs> Until the racist Germans went crazy. You know what I mean? Merkel said, well, this will be good. Plus, she felt guilty for what the Germans had done to the Jews. She come from Eastern Europe, you know what I mean? But suddenly the Germans said, don't you remember? We're Germans here now, come on. You better change this stuff. So there's not too much difference between the two. So when we look at John Locke, John Locke, first of all, believed in private property. By the way, all of these pretty much were about greed and control, all of them. But the thing about Locke is, in his two treaties, the second treaties of government, what he says is this, the role of government is to protect private property. That's the essential role. And so he created the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. The US is based on that. The reason why England, and he's an Englishman, isn't uh, as lock oriented as this country, the United States is, because they still have a queen. He kept the queen out in his system. You know what I mean? And so the point is, this system is one that is designed to see that when you have government, its sole role is to protect the rich. Its sole role. So when they're telling you they're bought off by lobbyists and all this stuff, it was set up that way. They don't need lobbyists because government is given no control over the rich. In the United States, they could export the whole industrial economy to Asia and to Mexico. And not a vote occurred in Congress. You hear me? And so what's your government for if your government is making the decisions that aren't important and the people who don't have a government, that is the corporations who tell you when you're hired and when you're fired, have all the control. And so this is the John Locke system of government. It is one designed to control, I'm quoting Madison, one of the founding fathers of the United States. When they set up the, the constitutional system, the federal government, they said the role of Republican government is to control the people. And then it said, and then to control itself. Now, of course, if you've got a government in control of the people, what's going to check the government and put them in control of themselves? And then he said, because, check this out. This is going to show you that actually white people ain't done. He said, because <laughs> if you give the people power, he's talking about white people, they will equitably distribute the wealth and they will not pay their debts, meaning all these mortgages that you have that take 30 years to pay and you pay four times what the house costs. That's called usury anywhere else, but it's legal when you buy a house. And you're almost grateful to because it's your house, but it belongs to the bank. And then once you get it, in the United States, houses are built the last 40 years. 
Chances are you got an old one if you were black anyway. So it's already obsolete and falling apart. But if you got a new one, by the time you pay the mortgage, it's got 10 years left on its life before it falls apart. You understand? <laughs> so the point is, this is the role of Lockean government. The role of Lockean government is basically to control the people, to protect private property. Let me cook up out. We'll get to that later. So the point is this. What's going on? The point of this is this: that despiritualization has been a major part of the project of European control. And by De taking the spirit out of things, you separate yourself from it, and you can use it for control on the scientific, on the mental, philosophical level, on the political level, on every level. There's another thing that we need to understand about this European worldview. We're sold this idea. Many people come to the West, come to the United States for freedom, for justice, for equality. And of course, freedom usually means to get rich. <laughs> but for freedom, for justice and equality. And in France, liberty, equality, and fraternity. You understand? Yet every time they had a revolution, the majority of whites didn't get this equality and this freedom and this justice. You know? In the United States, they had a war of independence. And while the War of Independence was being fought, you had whites who were fighting. By the way, the majority of blacks fought for the British. We fought against the Americans. Because the British promised us freedom. You understand? And so the thing is, while whites were fighting, poor whites, they had no shoes. They often were poorly clothed in the winter. And they weren't paid. But their lands were being seized by the government. And they had a big rebellion called Shays' Rebellion. This was at the end of the War of Independence. Shays' Rebellion was a series of rebellions across uh, the East Coast and Midwest where white farmers were marching on courthouses and stopping them from selling their property because their property was being sold because they couldn't pay the taxes. They couldn't pay the taxes because they were fighting in the War of Independence. <laughs> but the rich, who were the officers, they not only got paid, they got retirement pay. When the War of Independence was over, they didn't even pay them for their service. And so these whites began to march on courthouses and to stop these foreclosures. And that's when Washington called the Constitutional Convention. It was to prevent these whites from overthrowing the property class. And it was held in secret because if the whites knew, they would have rebelled against it. And so a federal government was created and the people who represented Washington was 1% and they controlled 50% of the wealth. And now 1% controls more than 50% of the wealth in the United States. So this has been the nature of this system. There's a conception of freedom that we need to understand. And so the Europeans talk about freedom, justice, and equality. But to understand the European conception of freedom, you need to go back to their first philosophy. And again, I want to credit Jake from Chicago for this insight. The first philosopher was a man named Hesiod, H-E-S-I-O-D, Hesiod. In uh, universities, he's not included in the curriculum in the philosophy department. He's usually in the humanities department because he's an embarrassment to them. He was illiterate, he was a sheep herder, and he was a poet. Illiterate, see, that's embarrassing for them. We call it the oral tradition, you know? Now, Hesiod's views were the views of the average Aryan, Greek. And so his view of freedom is very important. He has two works, one called Theogony, the other is Works and Days. I won't go into the work ethic. It comes out of works and days. He gives birth to the European work ethic. But the thing is, he talks about freedom. And so he talks about the heavens. And in the heavens, you have this war between the gods. You know? And Zeus is the supreme god. But the key point is how the gods war 
and what the gods think about freedom. And the thing is, you've got to understand about people's view of God, it's usually their view of themselves. People usually create God in their image, you know, or it's their view of what they think God is. And so the Greeks were always at war with each other. City-states were at war with each other. And one would win, the other one would lose. And that's why the Greeks are famous for tragedy. Because if you're engaged in war all the time, your life is going to be tragic. Because war has uh, unfortunate outcomes, and you're not always the winner. And so what Hesiod shows in the heavenly conflict is this, the European view of freedom. And this is a view that George Bush had. George Bush couldn't spell Hesiod. He didn't know who Hesiod was. In fact, he didn't know where the world was. When he was in Brazil with his uh, national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, later Secretary of State, and he observes, this is a big observation from a C student from Harvard. He was probably an F student. But he got into Harvard because his daddy had been there. He said, oh, there are black people here. Connie was embarrassed. He says, oh, yes, this country is made up of the majority of Africans. Oh. <laughs> he also said this, America's doctrine towards the world, and this is going to give you a hint of their definition of freedom. He says it's preemptive, meaning we can take out any power we want to. He didn't say if they threaten us, that they're going to invade us. He was dumb enough to state what the American doctrine of freedom is. The European, the British, the French, the Germans, they all have the same, I'm telling you this Aryan worldview is all the same, and they all bow to this. George Bush couldn't tell you what who Hesiod was, but when he announced this preemptive doctrine, which all American presidents have followed, but been too smart to say it. That's why they did it. They had a Gulf of Tonkin resolution in Vietnam and said their ships were shot at, which was a lie. You know what I mean? He was giving enunciation into Hesiod's definition of freedom. What is it? That freedom is arbitrary. The Western definition of freedom is Whoever has the power does whatever they want to with it. Check out European history, and I think you will find that that's the case. Take the Jews. I was listening to a, a program on the extermination of the Jews, and these were scholars on the final solution. And so they had all of these elaborate discussions on why Hitler killed the Jews. And then one scholar said, because he could. <laughs> wow. Simple. Because Europeans, not all, but too many, the Swedes were good when it came to protecting Jews, but a lot of them practiced anti Semitism, just as they practiced racism. The Germans said they didn't know what Hitler was doing, they didn't care. You understand? They didn't oppose it. And so the point is, you've got to understand that the Europeans will say freedom, justice, and equality, but Look at the practice towards themselves, towards us. Whoever has the power does whatever they want. When the British had power, what did they do? They went and sliced off Irish heads. They went off into Tasmania and killed everybody. They went into Australia and wiped out the aborigines. You understand? They did what they wanted to do because they could do it. This is an extremely important point to get straight because if that's the view, then it means that freedom is savage. It means there is no ethics to the operation of freedom. Freedom operates purely according to power, whoever has the power. The Greeks said this, that if you wanted justice, you needed to at least have enough power to stop someone else from doing you in. That was their idea of justice. Their idea of justice was to at least be equal to someone else that is oppressing you. And there should be a lesson in this. You need power. You need not believe in what people say. You need to understand what they do. And you need to make yourself strong. But you need not embrace this concept. Because if you do, you're no different from those who oppress you. And some of our people have embraced this concept. Look at the Congo. Look at how many Africans have died in the Congo. 
<laughs> and those are resource wars sponsored by corporations, but Africans are executing them because we've taken on a mindset of the European. You hear me? A mindset of the European. So let's get something straight. I'm not just making a critique of the European worldview, the Aryan worldview, but a critique of those of us who have taken on the mindset. Therefore, if we're to free ourselves, then one of the things we have to do is rid ourselves of what in the States we call the Oreo cookie model. <laughs> Black on the outside and white on the inside. Yeah. But this applies to everybody on the planet, the banana model. Yellow on the outside and white on the inside. Because you've got many Asians who are bought into, look at China, they bought into this capitalist model. It's true, they've done some good things for their people, but how much good can you do in a system that's based on inequity? It's probably going to eat them up sooner or later. And you've got to get out of the apple model. Red on the outside, white on the inside. Now I might say in, this, in the United States, you don't have a lot of apples that are white on the inside. You have some. They know they're in there. They've been crushed, but they're coming back. They wiped out 90% of them, but they're coming back. And they're our natural allies. There's one group of people we could go to for support. It was Native Americans. And you had a group of soldiers. They were called Buffalo Soldiers. You've heard of them. Buffalo Soldier. Bob Marley would sing about it. These were soldiers that fought in the Civil War. They were armed. Lincoln was losing the Civil War until he emancipated blacks. And that was only because he was losing the Civil War did he do it. A couple of hundred thousand black men got Winchester rifles. And you give a black man a machete and he can win a war. That's what happened in Cuba. I was in Cuba at the National Museum in 84 and it was a picture of an African warrior in Cuba under Antonio Maceo, greatest warrior in Cuban history. Castro followed his policy in the Sierra Mastro. And he sliced a Spaniard in half with a machete. In half. What we can do with a knife. Imagine what we do when we got a gun. And so when these black men got guns, the war shifted. And they had a thing called the Fort Pillow Massacre, where white Confederates killed every black prisoner they caught. And after that, the black soldiers' motto was, remember Fort Pillow. And every time we caught the Confederates, they faced the same thing. Because these Africans, most of them were not Christians. Those that were were Old Testament. And they believed in an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, an arm for an arm. My ex-wife would say, you mess with my dog, I'm going to mess with your cat. And that was their philosophy. <laughs> they were tough. You hear me? Tough. So these buffalo soldiers. They wanted to use those weapons to defend black communities in the South, but they sent them west to kill Native Americans. Let me tell you oh, something. Yeah. You know, I work out at the Y, and there's a brother who's a retired major uh, in the Marine Corps. In my brainwashed days, I was a Marine Reservist. I was a machine gun. <laughs> I did mountain leadership training, uh, desert warfare training, amphibious landing training. I was the best one in my unit. They wanted to make me a officer. But I was in the Black Liberation Movement. I was leading the movement in San Francisco, 10,000 people. And my mind had been free. When I joined the Marines, my mind wasn't free. And so when my company commander said, my name was, then was Bill Bradley, Bill, you're the best Marine in our unit. We'd like to send you to Quantico. And I said, quant to myself, Quantico like hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Quantico like hell, you know? Now, I, I'm talking to this brother who works out at the Y. He's in the Marines. He, he retired because he got an injury in Vietnam, a minor injury, but he got him retirement. Went back and got him a law degree. A little guy, about 86 years old. And I gave him two of the volumes of my books on leadership to show respect for him because I want to tap him. This is part of my apprenticeship. Learn from him about the Buffalo Soldiers. But what did he tell me about it? Number one, they could ride for three days without getting off their horses. Three days on hard leather saddles. Only the Indians could do that. The whites couldn't ride a half of them. 
And secondly, he said this. They were sent there to kill Native Americans. The Native Americans called them buffalo soldiers. That was an honorific title because the buffalo is a sacred animal for the Native Americans. And the African is of that color, but he's a brave human being. But this brother told me this. He said, the buffalo soldiers spent more time defending Native Americans from whites than fighting Native Americans. So the whites sent them there to kill Native Americans. And they were there aligning with them. And then when they saw that they were protecting white settlers who wanted to kill Indians to get their land, and they saw they couldn't have any, a lot of them went and joined the Native Americans and made them some um, Native American wives, you know what they say, once black, never back. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so this African made the difference uh, in this war, and uh, made it in the Civil War, but also even in the relationships between Native Americans. So if we're looking at the European or Aryan worldview, despiritualization is something that we've got to understand is a problem. Because we are, in essence, spirit. A human being is spirit first. When this body dies, it's a spirit that goes on. It is the spirit that is inside of us that is the most beautiful part of us. It is the eternal part of us. It's what inspires us. Love is like one of the highest aspirations of any human being. To be loved. To love themselves. That's a spirit. Love's a spirit. It's a good spirit. So, if we're going to look at the... African worldview as opposed to the European worldview. I talked about the Bambara, but I want to put some emphasis on liberation movements and how they provide an alternative to this Western worldview. Most scholars will not approach liberation movements because they haven't been involved in it. And they tend to discredit them. Oh, we're activists. Oh, we're crazy. I should stress, my scholarship comes from being an organizer. And it comes from my miseducation, which in the course of struggle, I underwent an awakening. We're going to talk about the awakening process tomorrow and what it takes to move from a state of unconsciousness to a state of consciousness because it's a systemization of consciousness. It's a system. Just as they put you to sleep, there's a system that puts you asleep. There's a system for waking you up. And I wouldn't be able to say anything I'm saying today if it wasn't for the liberation movement. The liberation movement woke me up. I was a government major. I was in the second year of law school. And I had an awakening experience that taught me I didn't know myself. It's a brother that takes me and my wife. Anytime we're going to the airport, his name is Norman Brown, a little brother. He's from a first all-black town organized in the United States. And he's one of my good friends. I say, Norman, I'm going to the airport. Can you take me? Give him a little money. But he ain't doing it for money. And Norman was a cab driver. He was my vice chair in the Congress of Racial Equality. And he was the one that taught me. He didn't know it. I didn't tell him for 20 years that he woke me up. And then I had to be re-educated. So the liberation movement, Cabral, the greatest leader in the 20th century, Cabral made this statement. He said, the liberation movement is an act of culture, meaning it's an expression of a people's culture. And he said, you can measure a people's chance for achieving liberation by how different their culture is from the culture of the oppressor. And I'm using the liberation movement as a vantage point for looking at alternatives to this mad European worldview, because if the shift is going to occur on the planet, it's going to be struggle. As Bob Marley said, it's going to be war. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but now for the minds of people, more than anything. War to free your minds. So as the president of Funkadelic said, your behind will follow. He didn't say you're behind. I'm cleaning it up for this audience. Understand? Because if your mind is free, your behind will follow. Your mind and your ass will follow. Yes, yes, that's what he said. <laughs> the president of Funkadelic, Bill yeah, Clinton, okay. he'd have made a much better president mega, mega than, than the one that you had. George Mr. Clinton. Mr. Clinton. George, George, Clinton. George Clinton. So the thing is, Cabral is saying, you measure your chance for achieving freedom by how different your culture is from the culture of the oppressor. So I want to, in this part, deal with two things. 
One is what the liberation movements of the 60s tell us in the states and currently about how liberation movements being expression of culture can provide an alternative to this European culture. And two, look at Africa. And look at the independence movements and currently what's going on and where the alternatives are there, these two. And this gives us at least a clue of where we're going. The liberation movements in the 60s in the United States, they were a product of the collapse of the European empire. With the end of World War II, America emerged as the foremost power in the world. It took the place of Britain. And so what happened when America emerges as the world power, they have a choice. Roosevelt had just died. Truman became president. So the question is, what's the course that America is going to take? They had a choice. They could go, to, go down the path of peace, demobilize their army, and build up their civilian economy and be very prosperous. Or they could go down the path of war. They chose the path of war. Now, Truman was a president who had a high school education. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, because a lot of people with college educations are pretty miseducated. Mm. If you are well-read, if you've done your homework, you could, you could be president. You could, you know, run an organization. I mean, Lincoln didn't have a college education. But the point is, Truman not only had a high school education, he hadn't read anything. Fell asleep in cabinet meetings. Didn't know what was going on. He was like Ronald Reagan on steroids. And Reagan really didn't know this. And he had Alzheimer's by the end of his presidency. He was a cue card president. Everything was on a cue card. If a press conference was held, he was asked a question not on the cue card, he gave the wrong answer and the corporate <laughs> press would always clean up for him. He was dumb beyond dumb. His wow. wife, who was an actor, Jane Wyman, divorced her because he said he was too dumb. This is an actor saying an actor's too dumb. Not to say that actors are smart or dumb. But the point is, he didn't have much going for him. But the point is, he's convinced that America must go on this war footing. And so there's a senator, his name is Vandenberg. And Vandenberg said, if you want to create a military system, you must scare the American people. And so what did he do? He said, the Russians are coming. The, the commies are going to get us. And they brought old uh, Winston Churchill, old moth-ridden Winston Churchill, who had been kicked out of office at the end of World War II. And what did he say? Because he was very charismatic. An iron curtain is descending upon the world. <laughs> and then, of course, Truman figured out, well, yeah, I can use that. And so they scared the American people. They created the national security state. And then what they did is they issued National Security Council Order 68. It was a secret up until the 70s that put this country on a permanent war footing. They created the myth that the Russians were a threat. The Russians lost 27 million people in World War II. Britain and the United States did not win World War II. They only defeated 10 German divisions. The Russians defeated 200 German divisions. But they were depleted at the end of that. They were no threat to anybody. The only threat posed uh, by Russia was to its own people. Stalin seemed to have a habit of killing his own people. He was lucky to have any generals to fight for him in World War II. You hear me? So the point is, it was a whole myth. And so America builds up this military industrial complex, and then what they do is go around and engage in wars. Korea, what happened? Mao Zedong ran them across the 38th parallel, America's first defeat. They go into Vietnam. The first rule in war is know your enemy. There's a couple of rules in war. Don't fight in Afghanistan. Don't fight in Vietnam, and don't try and take Moscow. <laughs> Those are rules in war. And Napoleon learned that third one the hard way. You hear me? But they didn't, they didn't read it. And then America thought that these Vietnamese 
And these Chinese, they were together. They didn't know their historic enemies. The Vietnamese constantly kicked the Chinese butt anytime they tried to invade their country. In fact, they kicked Genghis Khan's butt. The Vietnamese are bad. You don't know that? And let me tell you a little side story here. You may know it, but you probably don't know it. I know you've heard of Ho Chi Minh. He was the head of North Vietnam, who was head of Vietnam, National Liberation Front. He was a little guy. When he died, he could put all his possessions in a duffel bag. He cared nothing about money. He cared only about the freedom of his people. In 1968, Kwame Torre, formerly Stokely Carmichael, went to North Vietnam to uh, support the North Vietnamese against the Americans. And so he's waiting for Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh did not live in the president's palace. He lived in the servants' quarters, who was president of Vietnam. So he comes in with his sandals on, click, click, clack, clack. And Stokely gets down on his knees and starts praising Ho Chi Minh. And then Ho Chi Minh says this, I was in New York in 1920. I attended a meeting of the Honorable Marcus Garvey where he said Africa for the Africans, Asia for the Asians, and Europe for the Europeans. And he said, it occurred to me that I have no business being on a French steamship line working for the French. I need to go back and free my people. And then he said to Stokely, what is your black ass doing in Vietnam? You should be in Africa helping your people be yeah. free. <laughs> So a black man encouraged the yellow man to fight against the white man, and then encouraged the black man to go back to Africa to fight for his own land. Yeah. Isn't that funny? funny. What goes around comes, around comes around. You understand? So liberation movement's an act of culture. So what happens is the U.S. goes into decline. The U.S. is the world power, and in one generation they lost their power. In one generation they got knocked across the 38th parallel. So the least you could say they were half defeated. They only got the South. But that's a defeat. Mao kicked their butt. <laughs> he warned them, don't cross that 38th parallel. And when he did, they sent swarms of Chinese against them. I was in the Marine Corps in my brainwashed days, and they would say, that was a strategic withdrawal. That's like when you're on the streets and a group of guys come up and kick your butt and you run, that means your butt got kicked and you ran. <laughs> you got whipped and you couldn't even stay and fight. The bad Marine Corps that said they never retreated, they ran, you hear me? Ran, went into Vietnam and the Vietnamese kicked their behind. Went into Afghanistan, that's another country you don't go after. <laughs> In fact, when George Bush wanted to go into Afghanistan, his Joint Chiefs of Staff had no plan for him. The Joint Chiefs of Staff have a plan for every content. That's a white boy. He thinks on paper. Everything's written out. You hear me? <laughs> step by step. They had no plan for Afghanistan. They had a plan for the moon. No plan for Afghanistan. Why? They figured nobody would be stupid enough to organize uh, a war there. No one would send us there. You hear me? And they did. And they got whipped. <laughs> And they went into Iraq, and they destabilized the Middle East. And now you have ISIS. And now you have chaos in Syria. You understand? And so America is in decline. I, what I'm saying about that is this. We need to quit calling it white supremacy. They're not supreme anymore. Quit empowering them. Yeah, there was a time where they had it. They lost it. They're going down the tube. And it's a time for the rise of Asia. And it will soon be the time for the rise of Africa yeah. when Africa gets its act right. Yeah. When Africa gets down to the foot. <laughs> and when we rise, we better rise on our own values. We better not become mental Europeans yeah. and do the same thing yeah. they did. Because it's not a matter of power, it's a matter of justice. Yeah. And so liberation as an act of culture. What do the 60s tell us? I'm going to be very brief on this. But in the 60s in the US, I think there are a couple of things that are very important. Malcolm made an observation. Malcolm was one of the most brilliant minds produced in the world, in the United States. And I would say most brilliant political mind. I wear a goatee because Malcolm wore one. 
My first book was The Political Legacy of Malcolm X. I only have about four copies left, and so uh, I was told that a brother here wanted one, so I had to depart with one of my last original copies. He bought first it today. He published book, today. book. You know, so I brought it here for a brother. Um, I used to walk like Malcolm, talk like Malcolm. When I wrote the first draft of the political legacy of Malcolm X, I had Jacob Carruthers read it. Jake was surprised the black scholars don't like their stuff reviewed. Mm. And Jake said, you really want to know what I think? I said, yeah, you know what I mean? And then he, t he told me, you can't tell where Malcolm ends and you begin. That means <laughs> I need to tighten this book up because I was in worship of Malcolm. So I had to be able to stand back. But Malcolm made this observation. He said he used to think that the African Revolution on the outside was the most threatening to the West. But he said he had come to conclude it was the one on the inside of the Western house that was most threatening. And what he meant was, he said, Africans from the Caribbean, if they were from French Caribbean, went to France. Africans from British Caribbean, they went to Britain. From the Dutch controlled areas in South America, they went to uh, Holland, to Dutch country. Uh, wherever it is, they were colonized, they end up there. So he's saying, these Africans who got on the inside are in a strategic position. And then, of course, he's especially referring to Africans in the U.S. because we've been there a real long time. You know, a real long time. So he said, we are in a strategic position more threatening to the West than even Africa. And he said it's because you're on the inside. You can mess up their furniture. <laughs> but then he said, you're only a threat provided that you realize you are. And that's our problem. I'd say our biggest weakness as a people globally, especially outside of Africa, and among African leaders and the African elite on the inside of Africa, is that we underestimate our strengths. This is our biggest weakness. We underestimate our strengths. We are experts on our weaknesses. In fact, we exaggerate our weaknesses. We're so good at the negative. We can point out everything that's wrong with us, and sometimes it isn't even what's wrong with us. But we're good at that. But we do not appreciate our greatest strengths. Now, I know some, I'm talking to a conscious audience here. It may not be true of everybody here. But the fact is, the biggest strength that we underestimate is our own culture. That's our biggest weakness. And let me break this down. The African from the Caribbean, the African from South America, the African from the United States, the Africans who are in Europe from those places, the mass of our people, what do we underestimate most? The strength of ancient African culture. That's the everyday African. You know what I'm talking about, the everyday black person. If you're from Barbados, if you're from Jamaica, if you're from Suriname, if you're from uh, Haiti, if you're from the United States, what's the common statement? I ain't no African. I'm a Barbadian. Yeah. I'm from Suriname. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm from Jamaica. I'm a Haitian. Yeah. Huh? Where do you think this comes from? Where do you think the only difference between you and the African on the continent is they put you on a boat? Yeah. And the only difference between yeah. one and the other is yeah. they drop you off in different places. That's the only difference. And when I look, I'm just driving through, you know, we're coming here for this meeting today, and I'm looking at Suriname, black people, boy, they walk African. They look African. They got African behavior patterns. Of course, what you eat is African. Y'all yeah. be African to the core. Yeah. But the average one don't want to be called no Africa. Africa. Yeah. You hear me? Tell me the Chinaman who's running around saying, I ain't no Chinese. <laughs> the Japanese who run around saying, I ain't no Japanese, you know what I mean? The Indian man, I ain't no Indian. But we understand why. They didn't undergo enslavement. Yep. They didn't go undergo systematic brainwashing for a couple of hundred years. But that systematic brainwashing should not hide one thing. And that is, in all those islands in South America, in the United States, you took African culture, 
You reformed it, and it's the culture that walks on the ground in yes. each of these places. Yes. It picks you up, it inspires you, it gives you life. And it's not just your music, it's your whole way of life. Am I telling the truth? Yes. yes. Now we'll get to the conscious Africans, the ones who's here. <laughs> Our biggest weakness is not that we don't value ancient Africa. Oh, we value that a whole lot. We don't place the same value on the culture that we have created in our own reality. Some of us do, but a lot of us don't. A lot of us in the States, for example, in the 60s, bought into this idea. And much earlier, black people lost their culture in slavery. That's the myth. Um, one leading cultural nationalist who created Kwanzaa said that black people had no culture. The whites were too smart. They outsmarted us. Therefore, he gonna bring culture to us. You understand? Or the Nation of Islam, that was their teaching. The remote controlled, automatic pilot, brainwashed Negro. The average mass black person was somebody who was so brainwashed that he had nothing really to offer. And therefore, the Nation of Islam had to clean him up and turn him into some kind of person that was called an Asiatic black man. Now, come on. Uh, we were here before there was any people in Asia. Yeah. And we populated Asia. So why are you trying to identify with Asia when the source of your existence is Africa? Yeah. So many of our scholars were misled, not all of them, but too many, to believe that this everyday black person had no culture. And in fact, in the United States, the most cultured African is in the South. They're the kindest, sharingest, most spiritual people. If I hadn't found my wife in London, I was going to Georgia to find me a Georgia <laughs> people. <laughs> because they have integrity. Well, I found the same thing because Barbados has that same kind of thing. You know what I mean? That integrity. I'm looking for character. Not that other black women don't have it, but it's there in spades. And, and they're the first one to deny their African identity. But too many conscious Africans don't pay the same attention to the everyday culture of our people as we pay to Kemet, to the Yoruba, to the Asante, to the Dogon. We need to study our own selves yeah. as much as we study our own past because our past is being lived out in our present. And our people have created beautiful cultures all over this planet. Look at the Haitian. The Haitian, how were they able to overcome slavery? Yeah. Because they fused all those African spirit systems along with Native American systems into a fierce fighting system and Napoleon's greatest defeat was suffered at the hands of everyday Africans. You hear me? Not just uh, Toussaint Louverture, who was a great general, or Desilene, who was the greatest of generals, but the mass of Haitian people. Their culture inspired them. They believed in life after death, and so they believed there was no dying. The Kemites have a saying, life is slow dying, death's a rebirth to a new life. You hear me? They didn't want to die, but they knew there was nothing to fear by death. And by the way, that's what they say of the people of Suriname. This book I have on the revolt against the Suriname Negroes, written by a uh, Dutch captain who was sent in to try and kill Africans. And most of the soldiers that he uh, armed against the Surinamese got killed. And he said, you can't break these Africans. That's what he said. He said, these Africans are fierce. That's true all over the planet. What was fierce about it? Tomorrow I'm going into it. We carry the greatest educational systems on the planet to all these places. And these educational systems, we've discounted them because they weren't in writing. They were mostly oral. But our minds were books. If you take the average black person who comes from a rural area in the Caribbean or in the south of the United States or South America, their memories, you know, are better than a book. And if you go to Africa and an African becomes a Muslim, he knows the whole Koran by heart. Because it's the oral and the written. 
That's us. You hear me? And so the thing is, these Africans underwent some powerful training. It was so rough and so tough that they could handle anything like slavery. As bad as it was, we run around here talking about the mafia, the, the uh, maafa, and uh, how we got this post-traumatic this and that. That's a new concept, post-traumatic. Those Africans didn't have no post-traumatic anything. <laughs> Those Africans had the idea that they were not slaves in spirit, and they were not slaves in mind. And they did not accept anyone being a master over their bodies. That was the majority of our people. And that's why they came out <coughs> rough and tough. And yes, that first generation, they had love, but it was hard, tough love. Oh. Why? They came through a hard, tough life. But they believed in excellence. Yes. Your word first. And then whatever you do, do your best. And I learned that from my mother. Whip it, whip it into us. That old stuff. I would laugh when she whipped me. Laugh. And my brother just told me recently, yeah, she whipped me harder when you did it. And I said, why didn't you tell me then? This was a method for me getting her off of me. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking it was going to hurt you. You know what I mean? Why didn't you tell me? I wasn't looking and measuring. She's hitting you 15 times, and she hit me 10. The whole point was to break her spirit, to get her to understand this ain't working. It was hurting. And later she called me her Iron Man. Iron my butt, it hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned excellence from that. I also learned from that that whatever the enemy can lay down on me, hey, war is like this. It's like the kitchen. There's going to be grease. You better be able to accept it. If it's a boxing ring, there's going to be punches. You better be able to hit your opponent, but don't expect not to be hit. Just make sure you knock them out, or at least whip them. Don't run around complaining because you got hit. You're a fighter. Just don't get hit out. That's the whole objective. Make sure you win. The liberation movement's an act of culture. You measure it by the difference between the quality of the culture of the oppressed and the quality of the culture of the oppressive. Malcolm is saying that we're strategic. I'm saying that I would add to Malcolm's observation, the reason why we pose a strategic threat more than anything isn't just because we're here. We're here with our culture. It's our culture that makes us the most threatening thing because it's culture that inspires you to unify, to act, to organize, to struggle. That is the key thing. And your success is measured by how different your culture is from the culture of the oppressor. Let me just say a few things about the U.S., and then I want to say a few things about after. There's much more, but that's all we can deal with today. One is, we've seen that despiritualization is a basic problem with the Western worldview or the Aryan worldview. Big problem. We can say this of all of the African world. Spirit is key in our culture. All the African world. What do we mean by spirit? We've discussed it. You know what I mean? It's a God within. It's that force within. The uh, Bambara say, wisdom is a light within you. A light. That's a spirit. Uh, in uh, the blues, the blues singers talk about a love light. When they are approaching a woman, you know, Bobby Blue Bland, who's one of the great blues singers, and he's up in here dancing. I've, I've got a Bobby Blue Bland uh, CD that I just play over and over. By the way, I'm inspired by the music. African American culture has done two things. It's, it's developed the culture of popular choice in the United States. It is the culture of choice of white youth, Asian youth, Latino youth, some Native Americans, they have their own culture. These are the two indigenous cultures in this country. And so it's the popular culture. And it is the culture that counters this European American culture because our enslaved ancestors didn't say, we don't like what the Europeans do, so we're going to create this. We didn't create a culture out of reaction. Nowhere. It was based on what we needed to survive. So spirit was key to us, because that's our belief system. That's what carried us through. Without a belief in God, it could not carry us through the midnight of slavery. My sister is a spiritual worker. She does. She's an astrologer, a poet, really beautiful woman. And she had contact 
with an old spirit in slavery. And the spirit said, in, enslave, in enslavement, we lived outside of time. Meaning, there were Africans who were so in contact with the spirit that it killed time. Because what is heaven? It is infinite force, that's God, outside of space and outside of time. There's no time in heaven. It's only experience. Yeah. And experience in heaven could be a hundred years felt like that. Flick your finger. You know what I mean? And so these Africans, don't be running around here just the woe is me. Oh, they took this from us. They did. Yeah, it was terrible what they did. And yes, sooner or later they're going to pay for it. But the point is, these were tough people. And they recreated a culture. And so one of the reasons why we're a strategic threat, one reason why Surinamese culture is so strong on the streets is that whites see it as hip. And you see in the United States, the word hip, hop, hip comes from a Wolof word, hep. It means seeing from all sides. Happy cap, one who sees from all sides. Meaning not just with the head, but with the heart. You hear me? From all sides. And so one reason why our culture is popular all over the world is it's hip. Hip you hear me? It's cool. Whites can get down when they start to try and swing like that. They even feel a little bit of it. <laughs> it's just the problem is they got black Pete running around. Yep. They got some stereotypical picture of some buffoon that they've created and then want to tell you he's not insulting. That, you know, uh, he's, he's just a comical character. It's like little black Sambo. It's an exaggeration and a stereotype of African humanity to dehumanize Africans. And Africans here probably most don't like it, but they figure they got to get along in this society, so they don't want to upset the alpha cart. They don't want to go in white people's face, but they sure don't like it. And in the United States, it's little black Sambo. I remember I was in the second grade. I only have one teacher whose name I remember. A Chinese-American teacher, her name was Miss Chan gave us, I'm the only black kid in this class, an assignment to write a paper on Little Black Sambo. Little Black Sambo is like black feet. Anybody heard of Little Black Sambo? Yeah. 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 Big old, big lip, funny looking black person with a watermelon in his mouth. Mm -hmm. You understand? <coughs> and I was not conscious, but I was conscious enough to say I wasn't going to write it. And I went home and told my father. Not my mother, I told my father. And my father went to school and got into that Chinese American's chest and said, how could you, a yellow person, teach my child, a black person, to hate themselves? And she said, I didn't know. I didn't know. You know what I mean? So the thing is, this culture is our strength. This culture is what we draw from. And in the United States, but across the African world, spirit is key. But in African-American culture, spirit plays out in a particular way. And it is a spiritual material combination. It is a sacred secular combination. No movement in the United States has been able to get off the ground unless it could do two things. Get black people to tap their feet and think. It's got to have some soul, some spirit, and it's got to have some meaning. It's got to have these two things united. And the thing is, to provide an alternative to this European worldview, we have to understand spirit's got to be a part of everything. It's got to be the sacred and the secular, the spiritual and the political, the spiritual and economic, the spiritual and the social. It's got to all be there. It cannot be just one thing. And so in the U.S., we've created art form out of this culture. And this art form, among other things, is the blues. But you see, what a lot of people don't get is this. The blues are the spirituals. And what they don't get is the spirituals are the blues. When black people were singing the spirituals, by the way, we didn't call it the spirituals, white people did. Yeah. We didn't call it the blues, white people did. Mm -hmm. We run around here, people, some black people in the United States say, I don't like the blues because they think it's down. If you listen to the blues, there's one song that says, I got the blues, but I'm too damn mean to cry. Mm -hmm. The blues ain't about crying, and the blues is about everything. Uh, Johnny Lee Hooker, who in his 80s was cool, all wrinkled up and everything. He put that 
Stetson hat on and get that guitar and start plunking it. And then he talked about big legs, tight skirts. That's what I want. What's blue about that? You understand? Huh? <laughs> the blues is about the man singing about the woman and the woman singing about the man. The only difference between gospel and the blues is, is one singing about God, the other one singing about the woman. <laughs> That's the only difference. You understand? But the key thing about the blues is this. It's based on a twin ethic. And this is the mindset that is opposed to this Eurocentric mindset. And this twin mindset is a mindset This is one of the fathers of the blues, Sunhouse, you understand? Uh, taught a lot of blues musicians their stuff. There's a twin mentality, and part of the conquest of nature, the conquest of the planet, was due to this either-or mentality. It's either good or it's bad. It's separating matter from spirit. But we understand the two go together. So the ethos, the philosophy of the blues goes like this. The blues are the spirituals. Good is bad. God is the devil. Because there's no devil in African religion, by the way. I think that that's another boogeyman they created. God didn't create nothing all one way on this earth. And I would say gospel is sacred blues. In our culture, we have a brother named Martin R. Delaney, who was a great 19th century black nationalist, called for Africa for the Africans and Frederick Douglass, an anti-slavery fighter. Douglass is Delaney, Du Bois is Garvey, and King is Malcolm, and Reform is Revolution. Y'all get this? The point is, everything wow. is twin. Wow. Bad is good, and good is bad, depending on how you say it. It's bad, that means there's no good. Bad, that's good. You understand? We understand life cuts many different ways. And so part of the thing that is going to happen in terms of transformation is a shift in philosophy. I make this prediction. Now, by the way, Malcolm made the same one. But Malcolm was torn on whether or not we even had a culture. But there was a part of him that believed we did. But I would say this. Because African American culture is the cop culture of popular choice. And it is the culture that counters European American culture. It is going to become the dominant culture in the United States, because it already is, on the street level. It is in combat with the Eurocentric culture of John Locke, of Adam Smith, of Francis Bacon, of all of those guys, because they run the marketplace. But even whites are fed up with that because it's making more and more of them poor. And this country, here, Dutchland, it used to be they took care of people. Now they got this cold-blooded capitalism that has come from the United States yeah. that says nobody's entitled to anything except that the rich should get rich and the poor should get poor. Yeah. You understand? So the fact is, I'll predict because this country, the United States, is shifting demographically in 20 years. It will be black, brown, red, and yellow. Majority. It already is in the state of California. That's why Trump is trying to trump them, because the whites want to get their country back. They don't understand. It ain't Obama that took it from them. No. It's a fact of the matter is, their paradigm is bloody no good. And the fact of the matter is, people are defecting from it. And so Trump is trying to trump him by saying, I'll save you with it by using more of it. He's the worst part of them. How can the worst part save the people who are catching hell? And only some dumb whites are going to fall for that. It's a question of how many white people are dumb in America as to whether or not he gets elected. Because you can bet 97% of blacks, most Latinos, most Asians, and all the Native Americans, they're going against him. So the thing is, Liberation is an act of culture, and I would predict next 20, 25 years, you're going to see this, this shift, but it's already occurring. Because on the ground, Black Lives Matter, this movement, which is a very good movement, this movement is driven by this culture. So the thing is, 
this worldview is important, this, this sacred secular uh, approach. This is an alternative. The Europeans had this idea of arbitrary freedom. This is their idea of freedom. Um, their idea is whoever has power should run things. African American culture, African culture in general, has a different conception of freedom. And this conception of freedom is a conception of freedom that is a fusion of what blacks took from Africa and worked into America. And this is something that will free people. And again, the blues, the spirituals, they're an expression of it. By the way, in African American culture, the art form inspires all other forms. But in order for you to have an art form, you have to have a deep culture. Because the culture is the basis for the art form. And so the thing is, we have a different conception of freedom. And this freedom is good for the whole planet. But we operate on it. Sometimes it works to our detriment. Because sometimes we'll just rely on one part of this. Dizzy Gillespie, a great jazz musician, made this comment. He said, the African American conception of freedom is contradictory. Again, it's this twin mentality. That's one of the things about our culture. Is it's simple and complex at the same time. And so what did he mean by this? He said, first of all, it's based on discipline and freedom. Now in the West, you're either disciplined or you're free. Free means usually no constraint. Because arbitrary freedom, you do whatever you want to do. But for Af Africans, and in this case in the US, it's our motto, but I think it's true in many parts of the African world, freedom isn't free. It takes discipline to achieve freedom. Freedom is achieved through struggle. Freedom is achieved through effort. So, and freedom means you're not free to do wrong. You know what I'm telling you? It takes discipline. And then he's, and by the way, King, uh, when he was engaged in the Montgomery bus boycott, King made the observation, he said that uh, it was amazing how black people could be so disciplined in their pursuit of freedom. And King didn't know he was describing a key principle in African American culture, that is discipline and freedom. So what was amazing was just basic to black people. Uh, so Dizzy also made this comment. He said, our concept of freedom is also based on two other contradictory principles. This is called freestyling in hip hop. Spontaneous organization. It is basic to African people that we are most creative when we do something on, as one slave said, the spur of the moment. You hear me? What we feel at the time, because we're a situational people, and what we feel in the situation is what drives us to act. Now, Sister Gloria was saying that sometimes a weakness because people are throwing events together, don't plan them carefully. We're doing spur of the moment. But you see, what we're not doing is the organization. It's spontaneous, but it's organized. The Montgomery bus boycott was spontaneous, but it had been planned in advance. They were waiting for Rosa Parks. And once it happened, they put their plan into motion. If you have a great jazz musician, he gets up there, she gets up there and blows on their saxophone or trumpet, it's been years of discipline to blow to the point that they can come up with some new music. Am I telling the truth? And it's the same thing in struggle. If you're going to blow some new freedom in a struggle, you've got to be organized. You've got to be disciplined. And then that spontaneity takes you somewhere else. And you know what's beautiful about this? Not even black people can predict what black people are going to be able to do. <laughs> and if we can't predict it, you sure know they can't predict it. Thank you. Rosa Parks had said two weeks before the Montgomery bus boycott, black people were too hard to organize. You'd never get them together. And then look who got them together. She couldn't even predict what she could do. You understand? That's the nature of it. Because you're not just using this, I think, therefore I am. 
You're using the spirit, baby. And when the spirit picks up on the time, you can run on a dime. You understand? You can make things move, and you can make things groove. And let me tell you something else about this spontaneous organization is this. This notion of freedom is not about control. It's not about domination. It's about creativity. Because what is God about? God's the greatest creator of all. Look at nature. Look at the universe. By the way, the Dogon described the heavens as Ama sky. I mean, if you look at the heavens at night, you see the beauty of the heavens. It's, those are sparkling stars, which, by the way, is in all of us. You know, that miniature universe. That beauty is in all of us. When I see an awakened person, in this case, an awakened African, and I see the eyes, I was telling sister that today, here, I can see the sparkle in her eyes. You know what I mean? That sparkle, that's that light that's within. Nothing's more beautiful than that. That's the love light. That's the conscious light. That's the aware light. You understand? And so the thing is, these are alternatives to this mad European worldview. I could go into more on the African American, but I want to deal with Africa and then wrap up. Africa had a great gift, and it was the gift of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is the gift of the Africans in the Caribbean and the United States. Trinidad and the United States are the primary formulators of Pan-Africanism. Trinidad provided the largest number of great Pan-Africans. C.L.R. James, who had the great, how many people have heard of C.L.R. James? <coughs> great Pan-Africanist. Um, he was behind the Sixth Pan-African Congress. I chaired the political committee to that. That was the only real African Congress held on African soil. Uh, George Padmore, he was the organizer of the Fifth Pan-African Congress, a great African. Kwame Torre was himself from Trinidad. And then you have W.B. Du Bois, who articulated and organized the Second through Fourth Pan-African Congress and uh, you had Marcus Garvey, who never used the word Pan-Africanism or Pan-Africanist, but was the practicing Pan-Africanist, organized the largest organization of Africans in the 20th century, at least in the Western Hemisphere. <coughs> Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Garvey, my first master. We're going to talk about this tomorrow, how you take on masters to become masters. This is the real key thing. Hip-hop used to do that. Not Some anymore. still do. Some of them are now following Dead President. Underground hip hop is still doing it. Dead Prez is doing it. Yeah. Others are doing it. But these ones who are out here like Lil Wayne, <laughs> looking like Lil Monster, <laughs> up here putting down Rosa Parks, he had to eat his words. He thought he had so much money he could get away with that. The truth trumps money any day. You understand? The truth trumps it. You hear me? So the thing is, Pan-Africanism was a gift from Africans enslaved to Africans in Africa because we identified with all of it. After a while, we didn't know what part we came from. But we said all of Africa had to be free. It came out of Ethiopianism, which was this passage in the Bible that says, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch forth its hand under God soon. Garvey was an Ethiopianist. And we know Bob Marley and the Rastas. Ethiopianists. You understand? Ethiopianism gives birth to Pan-Africanism in 1900 with Sylvester Williams' first Pan-African Congress held in London. And so the fifth Pan-African Congress is a great meeting. It is the most important meeting that Africans had in the 20th century. Why? Because first, it was the first Pan-African conference where you had grassroots Africans who were trade union organizers and intellectuals in the same room. You had Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, the sequel. That's Nigeria, that's Kenya, that's Ghana. And you had Nkrumah as assistant to George Padmore. By the way, there's a little story here. John and Clark's told me a lot of stories, and this, this is one. Kwame Nkrumah, how many people have heard of Nkrumah? First president of an independent African nation south of the Sudan in the 20th century. Visionary. 
He went to Lincoln University for his education. Ten years, he was poor. He had to work hard. He didn't have any money. And that was good. He lived in the black community. He attended a study, study group that John Henry Clark was a part of. John said that Nkrumah's teeth were so white that he looked like pearls. That's typical of a lot of Africans, because Africans aren't using toothpaste, and they're not eating a lot of candy and stuff, and they got these beautiful teeth. Beautiful, you know. And any time Nkrumah would win an argument, because he'd wait until he could marshal his argument, he'd then tap you on your shoulder and say, I got you, I got you. And so there's a story where C.L.R. James gives Nkrumah a letter. And this letter um, introduces Nkrumah uh, to uh, George Padmore. And Nkrumah, I suspect, opened the letter because he refused to give it to Padmore. So he must have opened it. And um, when, when he opened it, I think he decided not to give it to him. So when Ghana becomes independent, he has an all African people's conference. And at this conference, um, he opens a letter. And the letter is a letter from, um, it's a letter to Padmore. And it says this I'm sending you this young man, Kwame Francis Nkrumah. He's a little confused, but he offers promise. <laughs> so I know he opened the letter. That's why he didn't deliver it. And so when Ghana's independent, he calls an all-African conference in Ghana, and he opens the letter because he's a practical joker and reads the letter. And he has CLR James there. He has Padmore there. He has all of them there. He said, do you think that I have some promise? And then he goes, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> Padmore was the principal organizer of the 5th Pan-African Congress. <clears throat> Padmore had worked as a colonel in the Russian directorate under Stalin and fell out in World War II <laughs> over the issue of the Russians placing uh, the freedom of Russia over Africa. So they wanted African freedom fighters to get behind Russia and the West. And these were colonizers, meaning postponed African independence. So he left the common term for that. He organized the Fifth Pan-African Congress. This was the most important meeting of Africans in the 20th century because Africans not only plotted the independence of Africa, but carried it out. Very few conferences he lead was to that. Trinidad, wasn't he? Yes, he's from Trinidad. Um, one of the reports of the Fifth Pan-African Congress made this observation. It said that colonialism had disrupted the democratic traditions of traditional government where the people rule. That was a very important observation. That came from Nkrumah's report. And what that should have meant is that African leaders who would go back to organize Africa would go back to draw from the greatest traditions of governance, which is consensus democracy. That's the basis for African governance. But instead, African leaders made the mistake of going for, and that's C.L.R. James there, this is Kwame Nkrumah, going for the European nation state. This was Africa's biggest mistake. Now, understand this. When the Japanese decided that they wanted to catch up with the West, they sent their students all over the world to learn Western science and technology. And they had what they called the Meiji Restoration, M-E-I-J-I, -I, Meiji Restoration. And this is where they industrialized China in a few short years. But under Chinese rules, I mean under Japanese rules. What happens with Africa's independence is, African independence leaders had faced colonialism and slavery. And in the process, Europeans had created a missionary school of education, of miseducation. And so the African independence leaders of the 20th century are different from the African independence leaders of the 19th century. The 19th century came from secret society. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. They produced masters. 
But the 20th century, there were products of missionary education. The missionaries succeeded in creating a middle class in Africa. That's positive and negative. But one of the things that it succeeded in doing was, and this was a failure for Africa, is that this miseducated group, which started with Africans who had been enslaved by their own people, freed by the British, and then came back into Africa and saw the British that freed them as their friends, yeah. they came back arguing two things. Africa needed Christianity, and it needed the European nation state because they thought that the European nation state would give Africa the power to compete with Europe. And by the way, the first missionaries were not colonizers. The first missionaries, in fact, had an interest in Africa. But by the time this project was carried out, these missionaries were in the pay of colonialism. And so what happens is the Africans who inherit the mantle of independence, they have been trained to believe that the traditional African system of government won't work for Africa. They believe that modernization and Europeanization are the same thing. When in fact what Africa needed was Africanization and using Africanization to modernize in a way that would suit Africa. But it's understandable why this happened because Japan didn't face colonialism. Japan didn't face slavery. And so as a result, the African independence leaders think that the traditional leaders are the enemies of Africa. Some of them have been used by the Europeans, but most of them have fought the Europeans. But even those that had been used, they came under governmental systems that were useful, that could be updated, that could be used for Africa's freedom today. This brother here, Donkwa. Donkwa was Kwame Nkrumah's teacher. Donkwa wrote the Akan conception of God. Donkwa was a specialist on traditional institutions. He was Nkrumah's teacher and brought Nkrumah back to lead the independence movement. But Donkwa thought he would become president. Nkrumah was able to mobilize the people around him. The unfortunate thing that John Henry Clark says, as I say and many others say, it's too bad Nkrumah could not marry Donkwa's ideas with his own, because Nkrumah did great things. He built the Volta River Project. He built up the educational system of Ghana. He built up the medical system. What Ghana has today is positive. Nkrumah built it. But he failed to appreciate the value of the African nation state. And as a result, that project didn't work. Julius Nereri, I met him in 1977. Uh, my group, Pan-African People's Organization, we sent a work team to Tanzania. This is the president of Tanzania. And we worked in the Ujamaa villages in 1973. These were agricultural projects that uh, Julius Nereri had called for. And these projects were using agriculture as the basis for building up the economy of, of Tanzania. And then from there, industry could be developed. <coughs> And in the first phase in the 60s, the people of Tanzania took this vision up and successfully built Ujamaa villages, successfully. Not only built villages, they built up hospitals, they built up schools, they built granaries, and they were ready for industrialization. And Nereri supported it, but it came from the people. No government finance. And the leadership killed it. Because they had been brainwashed in this European miseducational system of control, that this elite should control. These Africans who couldn't read and write, they didn't know what they were doing. And, in, and uh, Nereri got voted out, and these villages were disbanded. When we went to work in these Ujamaa villages in 1973, we didn't know it was the second phase of Ujamaa villages. And those second phases worked. And when I went back in 84, uh, to see what was happening, I get a report from a brother, highest ranking person from the U.S. and the Tanzanian government and the foreign ministry, and he's telling me all these villages had developed to the point of industrialization, and party leaders are saying, you're capitalists, and they're shutting them down. Why? Because the European nation state teaches the elite under John Locke model that you should be in control. 
And if there's anything you can get for yourself, you should get for yourself. Nereri was a good man. Nereri was somebody always in the villages. Nereri uh, would only drive in one of those Volkswagen rabbits. He didn't want a Mercedes. They had to convince him to have a bigger car just for his protection. He was a man of the people, absolutely brilliant, absolutely humble, beautiful man. Made the best moves for Africa when it came to coming to power. But the point is, it was the failure to embrace the best of Africa's past. I want to conclude on this one, because this applies to the whole African world. When I was doing research for this book, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, uh, the hardest thing I ever did. It took 14 disciplines to write this book. By the way, this book comes from a vision. A sister asked me how you want to be introduced. I said, as a spiritual scholar organized. I'm a spiritual scholar warrior, organized. My best stuff has come from above, the light. This book comes from a small light. Spirit gave me some answers. But this is the big one, and I asked the question, what did the ancient Africans mean by a just society? And I saw this beautiful light. And when I see the light, I don't hear any words, but it's like telepathy. And it's the most beautiful experience I've ever had in my life. There's no words that can describe a spiritual experience. No words. Uh, but the, the, the way I can describe it is this. I think that women are the most wonderful thing God's created. Yeah. And because uh, my mother's black, my grandmother's black, my great-grandmother's black, I think that they're the finest things going. I do. In fact, my problem is I've romanticized women. I try not to anymore, but that's been my problem. You know, I don't romanticize men. And if they want to send an agent on me, it would be easier with a woman. <laughs> not because I'd sleep with her. I have good discipline. I don't do that but just because I see all the good qualities, because it's like my mama, you know what I mean? But this spiritual experience was like beauty. I think black women are fine, but the beauty of the light was more beautiful than the, all the finest women. I'm not just talking physical fine, I'm talking spiritual fine. There's nothing that equal to this. I had some great teachers, they were wise, the wisdom of the light exceeded them by so much that you can't talk. And I'm a peaceful person. I don't have internal discord. But the peace I experienced in this light is like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. And love. My mother ran a free school. They called her teacher love. Sylvia Bradley. By the way, the book I'm writing now dedicate to my mother. I dedicated the mother principal to my grandmother because she was a master teacher and really beautiful woman. My wife said she was prettier than Lena Horne. They both look alike, you know what I mean? But my mother never had airs about that, but they called her queen. She was a loving person. My grandmother was a loving person, but the love I experienced in the light, which I know is the love of God, was like no love I've ever experienced before. So when I asked the ancestors, what did they mean by the just society? They gave me an answer. They said, the just societies of Africa were those where all the males and females were equally empowered to govern every phase of society. Now I got that answer after having dealing with what a lot of men have to deal with. I'm a warrior. I'm good with the tough, but the soft, I wasn't so good with. The feminine, I wasn't so good with. And I'd gone through crisis in my relationship. It was a lot of learning, and it led me to this. This book was the last thing I thought I'd ever write. Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. So then I was writing a book on this, and I had to throw away 180 pages on this book, because I realized I didn't know what the just society was. And then I started looking. And you know, when you get the answer, Stuff appears. You know what I mean? And so I went to Ghana uh, and uh, run into the greatest healer in Ghana and then go to the Minister of Culture. I'm in the villages in Ghana looking at the Asante Hina Santawa system. And I'm beginning to see this. And so what I found out looking at African families, because the basis of the nation is in the family. 
When I talked to John Henry Clark, because I'd be sharing my research with him, I thought I had something profound, and John would say, oh yeah, what I like about the African government system is it's consistent. The way it is from the family is the way it is for the nation. John would summarize it in one sentence, <laughs> just like that. I'd go, oh, all this work I'd done, <laughs> got it. And so, as I looked at these families, I took 14 ancient African family systems to, that preceded Islam and Christianity to see what's our family model. Arbitrarily, East, Central, South, um, and a little bit of North Africa. And what did I find? The same pattern, but no one had got it before. Why? Because the pattern looked different. It's like jazz, you know, you got different singers. Hip hop, you know, you got different poets, rap artists. But they're all coming from you know, the same art form, but different schools or different styles, and so you miss it. And so what I found when I looked at all these family systems was this. They weren't matriarchies. Women ruled, though there were some. They weren't patriarchies. There were some where men ruled. You know, African people don't like nobody ruling. It's kind of hard for either men or women to lay down a dictatorship on us. Real <laughs> hard. You know what I'm talking about? We all got to have a say-so in it. You know what I mean? And so what I found playing out, starting with the Twa was, I found that these were societies where there was balance between males and females. And I called them not matriarchy, not patriarchy, not matrilineal, not patrilineal. I came up with a new word, twinlineal. Meaning your lineage is not from your father alone or your mother alone, it's from your mother and your father. And it's not grandmother, grandfather, it's from both. And if God is to be personalized, it's not from he alone or she alone, it's he, she. It probably isn't either one, probably spirit. But if it is, it takes two to take. It takes two to create something. And that was the reason that African <coughs> governments were consensus-based. The biggest Asante governments at the, at the village level Everybody had to agree to make a decision. At the national level, it was the consensus of the king and queen mother's council. Everyone had to agree. The king didn't make the decision. The council did. The males and females on the council. And who was king? The most just. The one who didn't lie. The one who didn't bring dishonor on himself. The one who never turned his back on a war party. The one who never cursed. The one who was kind to his people. And that was the same person they call opinion whose lineage had. Same one. You had to elect the one that was most just. Not like in Europe. The cruelest one. The most arbitrary one. And if you went against your council, my name, first name, Oba. That means king, your well, guess what kind of king? The one that's picked like that. If your council tells you to do something and you don't do it after three times, they send you a bowl with a parrot's feather in it. And that means kill yourself. That's called removal. Huh? Because you're not obeying the people's will. And in ancient Ethiopia, your mother would take you out. She would strangle you because you brought dishonor on the family. You brought dishonor on the nation. Now, it's this system that is the basis of traditional African governance. I'm not arguing that we should go back to the past. I'm arguing we should go black to the future. Black to the future. Y'all get that? That's a hip hop expression. You know I mean? Take the best of your past and bring it up. I'm a traditional modernist. I believe in those traditions that are good and, and make them work for now because I believe it's got to wash, it's got to work. And so Africans, the key to Africa's freedom is simple. I'm going to make it real simple. Free up the woman and you'll free up everybody. <laughs> Because if you free the woman, you'll free the family. 
Because one thing you can be sure about is if you put some money in an African woman's hand, the family is going to see it. Mm -hmm. The children are going to see it. Even the husband can benefit from it. And so empowering the African woman, not just in Africa, but globally, has to be a major priority. And I don't mean this kind of stuff like South Africa where your parliament is almost 50%. No, I'm talking about intrinsic empowerment, where at every level, males and females, not just males and females, just males and females, not just any males and females, because women have been corrupted too. I'm no longer romanticizing the female. <laughs> So we've got to look for the ones that are just, and sometimes it'll be hard to find us, especially at the national level. Look at Guinea-Bissau. Emil Carr Cabral offered the greatest vision for Africa. And look where it's at now. Cabral is rolling over in his grave because the one thing he tried to do was to train an African leadership that would, as he said, return to the source and give up its elite role and become servants of the people and he was cut down before his project could be completed. If there's one thing Africa needs, the Caribbean needs, South America needs, the U.S. needs, wherever Africans are is leaders who love themselves and love their people. Because if you love yourself, you love your people. And I don't mean love yourself in an exaggerated way. And too many of them hate themselves, and too many of them are too greedy. Nigeria, they don't just steal, they steal everything. <laughs> I mean, if you look at uh, the Congo, Mobutu, Mobutu took everything. And that's why the country's in trouble now. It's actually got worse since he died. I didn't think it could get any worse. But it's got worse because the disorganization they created with him led to something worse. So I'm concluding by saying this. It's between the West and us. And it's not just us, but any with a just worldview. It's between a despiritualized view and a spiritual material view. It's between a depoliticized view and a spiritual political view. It's between an economic greedy view and a spiritual material view. It's for humanity or it's inhumane. And I'm not saying all of Europe is inhumane because one of the things that's going to happen in the U.S. is change the curves going to be, why did I say that the African culture would be dominant? Because the dominant group in 20 years will be people of color. The Latinos will outnumber us. The thing is, our culture is the popular culture of choice on the ground for them. Second generation Latino comes through us. Theirs is not homogeneous. Latino can be South American, Central American, or Mexican American. But when you become a second generation Latino in my generation, your culture, if you come from Mexico, is salsa, that's really African. But when you become second generation in the US, it becomes salsa. You hear me? <laughs> double whammy, double African. And you better understand that it's this African that's always on the cutting edge of change. I said before, this act, Black Lives Matter, we'll see where it goes. But what I like about Black Lives Matter, a lot of sisters in it. I called one up who's Dr. Abdullah, who is chair of Pan-African Studies, Cal State, Los Angeles. It took her a little while to call. Actually, she tried to call me before playing phone tag. We finally called her. And I said, sister, I just wanted to call you to say this, because I heard her on KP, KPFA which is an independent radio station. And I said, I just want to call you and tell you this. We are very, 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 very proud of you. And she said, oh, that means a lot. And then I found out she was a student at Berkeley High when I go there to speak and turn out Berkeley High. And she had a teacher. His name was Richard Navies, and we would team up. He was a beautiful brother. Tall, dark, and handsome, wearing these leather, rode a motorcycle, raised his kids by himself. One became a professional football player. The other one got a PhD. The other one's a teacher. He died of a rare blood disease. She said, 
You two were inspirations for me. Well, I said, baby, you're an inspiration for us. You hear me? And one of the things I like about Black Lives Matter, not only women playing a leading role, but the fact is it's not based on singular leadership. Black Lives Matter, they talk about not uh, collective leadership. They call it leaderful. Because when black people stood up in Ferguson after the murder of black people there by the police, they held on for months. And then this spread. And it spread not through any one person, but through a collectivity of young and older brothers and sisters, mainly young. And standing up against the police that takes a whole lot of courage. And you see now with these presidential elections, these Black Lives Matter are the ones injecting themselves into Bernie Sanders, who was talking about the divide of rich and poor, but left blacks out. And suddenly, he's going to have a, a black person on the platform writing committee for the Democratic Convention. <laughs> That's Black Lives Matter. Not that it's going to matter that much for the Democratic Party. But the point is, this culture is the culture of choice. This culture around the world offers the opportunity, the chance for freedom. But we've got to be true to its best aspects. Hotel. Thank you. Hotel.